enterprise software investments in AI, key enterprise business technology predictions, inside the mind of a technology consultant, and digital transformation quality assurance. Those are just a few of the topics we're going to cover today in episode number 113 of Transformation Ground Control. This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 113. My name is Eric Kimberling, your host for today. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world with their digital transformation journeys. And this is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation. We cover every week topics ranging from strategy to change management to program management, process improvement, enterprise architecture, emerging technologies, all the stuff you need to know about digital transformation. That's what we cover here in this podcast. It's also one of the few, if not the only, digital transformation-related podcast that is named after a David Bowie song, which is uh, Space Oddity. If you're familiar with that song, it's the the song about space travel, and uh, it's the one that talks about ground control to Major Tom. So uh, given that Third Stage is a rocket launch analogy, and I'm a big rock and roll fan, I decided to name the podcast after David David Bowie. So a little fun fact for you, if you weren't aware of that, if you're not a longtime listener, you may not know that, but that's where the name Transformation Ground Control comes from. We've got a great episode for you today. We have a few different topics we're going to cover here to start. Um, we're going to take some questions and answers from the audience uh, in the opening segment. In addition to that, I'm also going to talk a little bit about enter- enterprise technology investments in AI. Uh, Salesforce, in particular, the CRM software company, recently announced a pretty significant venture capital investment in AI-related technology. So I want to talk about that and what it means to the enterprise software space. We'll also talk about some of the key enterprise business technology predictions for 2023 and beyond, uh, based on another industry analyst in the space. And then in the second segment, we're going to shift gears and talk about the inner workings of the consulting industry. So we're going to talk about uh, really inside the mind of a technology consultant. I'm going to take audience questions and uh, cover some of the pros and cons, the good, the bad, the ugly of technology consulting, which is going to be relevant whether you're looking to be a consultant, if you're already a consultant, or you're looking to enter the enterprise tech space, whatever the case may be, uh, that's what we're going to cover there. And also, it's also relevant if you are interested in potentially hiring a consulting firm. I also want to talk about some of the things you should be aware of and thinking about as you evaluate potential consulting partners. And then finally, the, in the last segment later in the show, we are going to play you a clip from a recent event that we hosted, a digital online event where uh, myself and two other colleagues, uh, Stuart Robb from our UK office and Marcus Harris, who's an attorney from Taft Law, they're going to be on, or we're going to play you this clip where the three of us talk about digital transformation quality assurance and what is independent quality assurance? Why is it so important? Why is it something you need to augment your system integrator and your software vendor during your digital transformation? We're going to dig pretty deep into that topic later in the show, so be sure to stick around for that. But before we get to our other segments that I mentioned here. Let's talk about some of these uh, trends in the market right now or some recent news. Uh, Most notably or most recently, just a few weeks ago, Salesforce, the CRM software provider, announced that they were launching a $250 million fund to invest in AI or AI technologies. And I find this super fascinating because ever since ChatGPT came out and Microsoft invested in their own AI, open source AI option, It seems like AI has just taken on or gained a lot of momentum. Um, AI has been around for a long time. There's been a lot of talk about it since as long as I can remember. When I was a kid, I remember hearing about AI and thinking it was kind of a a cool, neat, futuristic sort of a thing. But it seems like now, at least at the enterprise level, you're finally starting to see some traction where you're actually starting to see some actual use cases of AI. And now you're seeing big software vendors like Salesforce invest in AI options. 
And here's something, a fun little fact I didn't know, and maybe some of you listening already knew this, but I did not know that, first of all, I did not know that Salesforce had a private equity or, or venture capital arm of their company called Salesforce Ventures. I didn't know that. I, I think I may have heard it in passing or something a long time ago, but I guess I didn't know what exactly they did. But it turns out Salesforce Ventures in the past has also invested in companies like Zoom, uh, the, the Zoom conferencing um, software, which in hindsight was a brilliant investment, especially given given COVID. They also invested in Snowflake, the BI, uh, the business intelligence firm, and then also DocuSign. So just sort of a fun fact if you weren't aware, which I was not aware that they were investors in those three companies. But what they're saying now is that Salesforce Ventures has raised $250 million, and they're going to apply $250 million to artificial intelligence tools. So they have actually developed um, some thoughts or sort of regenerative or not regenerative, but generative AI tools that will allow people to use Salesforce, their CRM solution to create, in addition to customer service responses, uh, sales emails as well. So those are two examples they give in the article or in the, the release about this investment is that they're actively developing these tool sets to use AI to help people make better use of and better automation within the Salesforce CRM solution. So super interesting thing that we're seeing here in the marketplace with Salesforce being aggressive about investing in that. We already knew about ChatGPT, obviously. We also knew about um, Microsoft investing uh, in their own open AI technology or integrating open AI into their Bing search engine. So we knew, at least at the consumer level, we've sort of seen AI really getting a lot of momentum on that front. So it's really interesting to see now the enterprise technology space finally catch up to that, which is typically the case. Enterprise technology is usually a bit lagging in terms of uh, the really cool innovations uh, in the space. So uh, interesting stuff there from Salesforce in terms of investments in AI. Curious to see what you think, though. Do you think this is a big deal? I'd love to hear your comments in the, the notes below or in the comments below. Um, do you think this could change things for Salesforce? Is it giving them a competitive advantage? Is it just a bunch of hype? Um, love to hear your thoughts on where you think AI is headed within the enterprise technology space. Now, a second thing I wanted to share, or a, a second article I wanted to talk about here in today's episode is this uh, article from Forbes magazine called Five Key Enterprise Business Technology Predictions and What They Mean for Enterprise and Service Providers. Uh, this is an uh, article that was published earlier this month uh, about where this particular analyst sees the technology space going, the business technology space. And I I really like this article. It's really fascinating to me because usually when you read an analyst or a consulting firm or even just any sort of industry publication talking about emerging trends and where technology is headed, you you sort of get wrapped up in a lot of the emerging tech, a lot of the really cool stuff like AI, like we were just talking about. Um, And good stuff, right? There's a lot of great innovations in the marketplace and a lot of great opportunities to take advantage of the metaverse and AI and all this cool stuff that's that's emerging. But what I like about this article is he talks about what he thinks is actually going to happen sort of boots on the ground in terms of enterprises actually adopting some of these enterprise technologies. And I tend to agree and, and think very closely or align very closely with what the author is saying. And the essence of what he's saying in this article is that enterprises are going to focus more on cost reduction and efficiency and automation and less on some of the really sexy, glitzy, fancy new technologies, or newer, newer technologies, I should say. And I think that's very true, especially given the backdrop of where we are right now. I think so many organizations are experiencing turmoil and they are facing a huge amount of technical debt and trying to just get the basics in place. And that's really the essence of his predictions here, sort of a back to the basics mentality. He doesn't use those exact words in the article, but I got a very much a back to basics mindset uh, in in his predictions. So he talks a lot about how organizations are going to focus more on high performance and productivity across IT operations, um, within the supply chain, the customer experience, and really just focusing on savings and value. And I think that's a great way to put it. And I think that's a good starting point for any organization is really to focus on the the basics rather than swinging for the fences and trying to invest in a massive quantum leap technological improvement overnight. Why not get the basics in place? Why not just automate what you've already got, get some low hanging fruit, get some momentum behind you, build a culture of digital innovation. And then you start to think about how can we layer on 
more advanced technologies like AI or metaverse type stuff, whatever the case may be. So I think this is a, something that's really interesting in, in that sense. And some of the other things that he talks about is digital synergies. So he talks about di- digital synergies and governance or convergence across functions and how it's going to tie together operations a little bit better. And he even says that uh, investment in high-end technology such as Web3, the metaverse, cryptocurrency, and quantum computing will take a back seat. Instead, the focus will center on eliminating waste and redundancy and standardizing processes and technology. Again, a real simple, basic sort of concept, but something that organizations haven't yet mastered. And it's important to master this before you start thinking about metaverse and Web3 and AI, quantum computing, all that stuff. Again, great emerging technologies, huge potential there in the longer term. But let's get the basic foundation in place first, the basics of automation. And then you start to think about how you can layer on some of those additional uh, technologies. Uh, he also talks about how business priorities and criticality based investments will take center stage. So this is where it's really focusing on the really important high value areas, things that will contribute to the bottom line, and less of a focus on necessarily pursuing best in class solutions in every area of the organization. Another great, I, I think a great way to think about this, because I think too often organizations, they, they jump too far And their organization just isn't able to keep up, and they end up very disappointed with the results that they get in their digital transformation. So what he's advocating here is, you know, why instead of trying to be best in class in every area, why not just pick off those areas of low-hanging fruit, high business value, quantifiable, measurable improvements to the bottom line, invest in those technologies first. And I think especially in today's uncertain economy here in 2023 as we're recording this, I think that's something that's very smart in terms of how you think about technological investments. The last thing you really want to do at this point, especially if you're in an industry that is cyclical or highly impacted by economic uncertainty, the last thing you want to do is end up in a a money pit of a digital transformation where you've just gotten yourself in too deep. It's too complicated. It's too much change. Your organization can't keep up with it. Your people can't adapt to the new technologies. Rather than getting into that mess, why not invest less money, less time, less effort, in higher value areas. And then again, you build momentum, you build those competencies, and then eventually you start to think about some of those bigger uh, swings for bigger quantum leap sorts of improvements. He also talks about enterprise velocity and cost composability, a couple buzzwords that I was not super familiar with, um, and monetization as key metrics. So he's really talking about how organizations are really going to focus on measurable types of technologies, technologies that have a measurable impact on the business. And then the fifth prediction he has here that I find super interesting and relevant, and it's actually an angle that I hadn't really thought about much before, is that CapEx scrutinization will become intense and the cloud will become table stakes. And he goes on to explain how companies are moving away from the big CapEx model more to a composable OpEx, um, or not not composable, but a uh, uh, consumable uh, OPEX sort of investment in cloud or SaaS technologies. So in other words, rather than having a big high dollar investment up front that you depreciate over time on the operating or on the capital expense side, instead, organizations are moving towards the uh, ongoing operating expense with software as a service or, or cloud solutions. That part I was aware of, but what I found really interesting is that he dives into and sort of uh, predicts that competition in the cloud space is going to give consumers more power. And I think that's something that's missing now is it's not really a level playing field. And I think cloud providers are enjoying somewhat of a field day right now because they are getting such high margins and uh, higher cost from from their, their customers. But I think what will happen over time is as more competitors enter the space and as organizations realize that they don't necessarily need to be locked into one cloud provider or one big software provider, they're finding that there are viable third parties that could be lower cost, higher value for them. And I think that's going to bring down the cost of cloud solutions over time. So that part, I, w- I hadn't really analyzed the market in that sense, but I, th- I found that really interesting as well um, in regard to some of his predictions for uh, the coming year. So very interesting stuff for certain and uh, really appreciated that, that, uh, that article, which again was from Forbes magazine. Now, I want to shift gears uh, based on those two hot topics and sort of shift gears and look at a few questions we've received from social media. 
So the first, uh, we've got a couple questions and, and we check this, we watch our social media channels and outlets. Uh, if you go to my YouTube and or my LinkedIn, those are the two areas where we tend to get the most comments and questions uh, on social media. Uh, but I'm also on Instagram and TikTok as well. So you can check uh, really any of those platforms. If you leave a comment or a question, I try to get to as many as I can, either in this podcast or sometimes I'll respond to questions just directly in a, in a short video on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube shorts. But here's a couple questions that we thought would be helpful to chat about and unpack a bit. But one is, is digital transformation and modernization the same? Um, and that's a great question. I, I don't tend to get too caught up in nomenclature. Maybe I should, but I don't. Um, I tend to think that digital transformation essentially is what it is to you as an organization. For some, it means just simply modernizing technology. For some, it means higher value investments in newer emerging technologies. For some, it means just doing a, a relatively simple upgrade of their existing technologies. For some, it means just getting real basic automation in place. So there's a lot of different things that digital transformation or modernization could be. So I tend to not worry too much about what you call it and more on how you define it for you as an organization. And whether you call it a digital transformation or modernization, I honestly don't think it really matters. I don't care what anyone calls it. I think it's more a matter of defining what is digital transformation to you. And we have some clients, for example, that are going through massive overhauls of their systems and mass replacements of their systems, complete rip and replace. And they're also investing in some, some higher value technologies along the way too. But then we have other clients on the other side of the spectrum that are more cautious. They're more risk adverse. Maybe they have less budget, less resources, less time, whatever it is. For whatever reason, it makes more sense for them to take more of an incremental approach, which I suppose you might call that more semi-modernization and less digital transformation because tra it's it's less of a truly transformative project and maybe more just focused on modernizing some of the systems. Again, I don't care what you call it, but it's a matter of defining what digital strategy makes the most sense for you and which one best aligns with your your goals and objectives as a as an organization. So that's the way I would answer that question. Unfortunately, I can't give you a, a super precise definition of digital transformation versus modernization. Um, if you can, if, if anyone listening has a better clarity on those on those exact terms than I do, I'd love to hear comments below. But to me, I, I view it more from a let's let's define a digital strategy, let's define it for a particular organization, and then you can call it whatever you want after that. In fact, most organizations name it something completely different that's branded for their own internal purposes anyway, so I don't get too caught up in that. But love to hear your feedback on that as well. Um, another question here, um, I had a video on my YouTube channel that I posted a few weeks ago, and it's about Agile versus Waterfall software deployments. And um, really trying to compare the two, the pros and cons of Agile and Waterfall. And by the way, there are pros and cons to both. I know I would, I think a majority of the industry is very pro Agile and not saying I'm not, but but there is a dark side to Agile just as there's a dark side to Waterfall. And my main argument, my main premise in that video is that for every problem that Agile seeks to solve, Agile creates a whole nother set of problems. And I won't dive into what those all are here today, but I encourage you to check out that video on my YouTube channel. If you just go to uh, my YouTube channel and search Agile, you'll, you'll find that video. This was published here in March of uh, 2023. But the question I received from that video is this, true or false, 80% of Agile is actually waterfall spread across multiple sprints. Um, I'd say yes, sort of, and maybe the sort of is qualifier is what the other 20% remaining is uh, this person is referring to. But in general, what I find is that generally with Agile, there's a more focus, more of a focus on rapid deployment and also rapid design too. And that's why I say sort of, because I think the design and the requirements definition, that's where, in my opinion, Agile tends to break down at times is because you can pick off a little piece of an organization or a little piece of technology and design and build it and deploy it really quickly in a sprint. That's fine. But if you're not doing it in the context of an overarching set of end-to-end -end business requirements and business processes, it's, you, you're, you're not going to get that standardization and that, that level of integration you're looking for necessarily. You could, but you're probably not. And so what we see is that a lot of organizations will take sort of a waterfall approach early in the project, you know, during the design and, and business requirements phase. But then when it comes time to actually deploy to the multiple sites or the multiple parts of the business, that's where they tend to shift into more of an agile mentality. But 
you're doing that after you've already taken that time up front to define all your business requirements, the end to end business processes, your future state operating model, all that stuff that quite frankly, most organizations are trying to realize and achieve in their digital transformations. And if you take a 100% agile approach, you're probably going to miss out and water down that desired outcome of having, having standardization and integrated business processes across the entire enterprise. So I think you do have to find that right balance. Um, I don't know if 80% is the right number, but I do agree that agile is, isn't as different as it seems other than it's focused on speed, which is fine. I think that's a, that's a positive thing, but I think the negative that has to be best balanced with agile is what do you do during that requirements definition, that business process, future state piece of it. And that's where waterfall I think has a slight advantage. So if you can get the best of both worlds there, if that's what you're trying to accomplish as an organization, then that could be a great, a great thing. So I'll cover one more question here, and this is about SAP Business One. And the question is, I'm about to buy SAP Business One, and I can't find any information regarding this mandatory migration. Is this going as planned before, or did SAP change its stance? From what I understand, both for SAP Business One and for SAP ECC and R3, all the legacy products essentially, uh, my understanding is that organizations have until 2027, I believe it is, to migrate off of those legacy systems onto S4 HANA, and those solutions will not be supported going forward. That's my understanding. Now, if they've changed that, I'd love to hear you know comments below. If you're part of the SAP ecosystem and have additional thoughts or different thoughts, I'd love to hear that in the comments below. But that's my understanding is that Business One will go away, as will ECC and R3. Business One is one that I, I kind of question the most because Business One is so different and the market is so different for Business One. Uh, or the con- customers of, of Business One are so different than ones that are using ECC or R3. Typically, ECC and R3, the two sort of old flagship SAP products, were for larger multinational sorts of organizations, whereas Business One was more for the mid-market. So it was a, it was a simpler version of SAP. I, I believe they acquired that solution years ago and have maintained that as sort of a mid-market option or alternative to their bigger flagship products. So if they do follow through and Business One goes away, it makes me wonder how are they going to satisfy that mid-market. I don't know that S4 HANA is going to be a good fit for a lot of the mid-market. So we'll see strategically what they do there. Um, having said that, I understand why vendors are trying to double down on their newer solutions because it's impossible or very difficult, I should say, to manage or maintain all these systems and uh, do it well. You know, So you're doing all this R&D, and uh, if you do it for three different systems – you're just spreading yourself thin versus putting all your R&D dollars and innovation into one product. So I get why they're doing it, but the problem is the best interest of the software vendors isn't necessarily the best interest of their customers. And I think that's where you're seeing a lot of conflict right now in the market is that customers don't necessarily want to move off the system in the amount of time that they've been given to sunset some of these solutions. And so one thing I would say just as a recommendation is just because SAP or whoever your software vendor is, by the way, it's not just SAP, Microsoft doing this, Oracle's doing it. All the big guys are doing this where they're essentially forcing you off or trying to force you off their on-prem or their old legacy systems. And I'm not here to argue about whether or not you should be on cloud or whether you should be on the latest and greatest, but I will say you don't need to be. If it doesn't make sense to you, if you don't have the budget, you don't have the risk appetite or whatever the case may be, it may not be the, the best answer for you. And what I would challenge you to do is really assess what your options are and look at the cost benefit and the risk profile of each one and objectively figure out what the best fit for your organization is. We have plenty of organizations that we work with, plenty of clients where migrating off of the old system makes a lot of sense. In fact, that's the case for most of our clients. But there's a subset of clients that we work with where it just doesn't make sense. They'd rather take the risk of having an old outdated system that's no longer supported, but knowing that they're not taking on what they perceive to be an even bigger risk of having operational disruption or over-investing in technology that isn't quite mature yet, which is the case for S4 HANA and Microsoft E365 and some of these other newer cloud solutions. These cloud solutions that have only been around for six or eight years or whatever it's been just don't have the level of maturity as some of the older systems um, that have been around for a long time. And say what you will about on-prem and how outdated that platform is, I get it, but the functionality and the pure capabilities of those systems have been around for longer, more money has gone into it, and therefore they're, they're more mature. Now, that comment will not be true in however many years from now, but as of right now where we stand today in 2023, there's a maturity gap between these newer cloud solutions and, and some of the older legacy products that these vendors are supporting, 
And that's the rub. That's the problem in the industry is they're trying to force customers onto these newer solutions that aren't as mature, but some organizations just aren't ready or willing to take that that sort of a risk. So great questions. I appreciate the feedback. And again, if you have questions along the way um, or at any point um, as you're engaging with our content, whether it's this podcast or other content on my YouTube channel or Third Stage's YouTube channel or any of our other social platforms, be sure to leave a question there. We try to get to as many as as we can and appreciate the audience engagement here uh, in this global digital transformation community that we're all part of. So we're going to shift gears here in a moment, and we are going to talk about consulting, the the consulting industry, tech consulting in particular. And uh, we're going to get into the mind of a tech consultant. And we're going to start off by getting into my mind, kind of how I view consulting and what I see is the good, the bad, the ugly. But I'm going to quickly shift gears and turn it to the audience and get their questions, their feedback, their observations about consulting. And the idea behind this segment is to help if you're trying to navigate a career in consulting or a potential career in consulting. I want to be able to hopefully open up some thoughts around what the industry looks like and what to consider as you consider that career. Or if you're an organization that is hiring consultants or you're, you've been tasked with finding the right consulting firm or managing the consultants you've been, that you've hired, uh, I want to view it from that angle as well. So it's meant to really uh, serve two purposes or accomplish two goals uh, in the conversation. So we'll get to that conversation here uh, when we return. But first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 113. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, streams every day, or every Wednesday, I should say, to those platforms. And you can also find those episodes on audio podcast platforms such as Amazon, Google, Apple, Spotify, Pandora, etc. So wherever you might listen to podcasts, chances are pretty high you're going to find us there. So be sure to check us out wherever you listen or watch the podcast. And uh, every Wednesday we have new episodes. Now, I want to shift gears and talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that is the consulting industry. It's the only industry I've ever really been a part of. My entire career has been in the consulting space. So I thought it'd be fun and interesting to have a conversation about what it's like in the consulting space. What are some of the strengths or the positives of being a consultant? What are some of the negatives? Um, What are some things to think about as you consider a potential career in consulting? Or what are some of the things to think about as you think about evaluating and hiring potential technology consultants. And really this whole uh, idea, you know, the, the thread itself or the topic itself is something that I love talking about because I get so many questions on social media and at networking events and industry events about, you know, how can I start in consulting or how could I be a better consultant? What do you recommend I do? Um, or, you know, how do I hire the best consulting firm? What should I be looking for? That sort of thing. So I figured it'd be a good way to unpack a lot of those questions that I commonly get uh, from the industry. And uh, actually the, the whole thing, the naming of this segment called Inside the Mind of a Tech Consultant uh, goes uh, actually as a reference to my love of crime TV shows. So I love to watch shows about uh, about serial killers and uh, any any sort of criminal activity. Uh, I, to be clear, I'm not a criminal and I am not a serial killer either, but I enjoy watching shows about it. And there's a TV show here in the United States. I'm not sure if it's global or not. I don't think it is. I think it's just in North America. But it's a TV show called Inside uh, the Mind of a Serial Killer. And I just thought, hey, why not have some fun with that and get inside the mind of a tech consultant, which I'm hoping is not as disturbing as being inside the mind of a serial killer. But you can be the judge of that as we get into the conversation. So we thought we'd jump into this topic, ask or uh, receive some questions from the audience and uh, answer some of the common questions that I get. So what I thought we'd do today in terms of getting started is, you know, one of the, the real simple questions 
that might be a good way to get started in today's conversation is why would someone want to be a consultant? You know, what are some of the reasons why I myself became a consultant and others that I've worked with throughout the years? Why would they want to become a consultant? And just to give you some backdrop, I've been a consultant my entire career. I, I don't know any other profession other than consulting, which is could be good news or bad news, depending on, on how you look at it. Um, I started in the late 90s. And quite honestly, it was a career that I did not choose or have intention of getting into uh, early on at least, especially from the perspective of being a technology consultant, I sort of resisted the idea of being a technology consultant in the late nineties, cause I didn't want to be perceived as a techie. And that wasn't really the career path I wanted to go down, but through a series of unpredictable twists and turns, I end up as a, a technology consultant, uh, not by choice necessarily, but I'm really glad it worked out that way. And some of the general reasons why I became a consultant and why for me personally, why I love consulting is for a number of reasons. I mean, one is that the variety of work is spectacular. I mean, you, you constantly get new challenges and new opportunities. You're engaging with new organizations, new industries, new people, new cultures. Uh, in some cases, if you're fortunate enough to work internationally, which I've, I've been very fortunate to work internationally over the years, you get to experience different geographic cultures and just different parts of the world and travel and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of really cool stuff about consulting that on the surface, at least can make it very fun. And so that's one thing that if you like variety of work, if you like to experience new challenges and constantly be learning, um, consulting is a, is a great career. I, I don't feel like I'm learning any less now than when I started. So even day one of being a consultant, I was learning a lot. I was drinking from a fire hose and 25 years later, I still am learning a lot and drinking from a fire hose because you're just constantly if you're doing it right, you're constantly listening and learning and understanding different scenarios and different situations that maybe you've never seen before. And what's really fun about it is you can you get the opportunity to apply some of your experience and lessons to new experiences in, in new situations, which is part of what makes consulting a lot of fun. So that variety, the constant learning are, are two uh, very cool things. If you if you like to travel, um, there's, there's constantly opportunities to travel, even in today's post COVID world. Um, travel is a necessity in most cases for consulting, regardless of what mainstream thoughts might be around working from home and working from anywhere. Consulting, in my opinion, is very much an in-person face-to-face sort of, uh, proposition, not necessarily Monday through Friday, like it used to be back in the day. Um, I don't, I think that's a bit excessive and a bit overkill, but having some human interaction and face-to-face and travel, uh, is still, in my opinion, very important to being an effective consultant and really understanding a client, their operations, their personalities, um, just getting to know, you know, the different people that you have to deal with as a, as a consultant. So those are some of the things that in my opinion are, are sort of the positives of why you might want to be a consultant for me personally. You know, one thing I was concerned about knowing about myself, even early in my career is that I get, I get bored very easily. I don't like to do the same thing for extended periods of time. And consulting was a perfect way for me to avoid that weakness or avoid that quirk in my personality, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and I love to learn. And so I, you know, I can't think of a whole lot of professions where you can learn as much as you do in consulting, not just in terms of formalized learning and training, but also in my opinion, even more importantly, is just learning from doing consulting and learning about different organizations and industries and technologies and all that good stuff. So those are some of the reasons why you might want to be a consultant, but I'd love to hear from the audience, especially for those of you that are consultants, or maybe you've been consultants in the past, or maybe you're aspiring to be one. What are some of the reasons why consulting appeals to you or why you think people might want to be, might might want to be involved in, in consulting. Um, and and I'm already getting some comments here, which are really good ones that I'm going to get to here as it relates to that. Um, Gassan on LinkedIn says uh, to consult or not to consult. That's the question. Um, my bias opinion is consult rather than not consult, but um, that's that's my personal preference, and it's it's not for everyone. I'm going to get to the. I mean, in a moment, I'll talk about why it's not for everyone, but that's a great great way to frame it there, uh, Gassan. Um, also, uh, whoops, one second here, having an issue. There we go. Also on LinkedIn, and this is. Uh, I'll mispronounce the name. If I mispronounced it the first time, I'm probably going to mispronounce your name again uh, for a second time. And I apologize for that, but I'm going to say Laik um, on LinkedIn. If I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize. Um, Laik says, same for me. I know nothing else. So I'm glad I'm not alone. I'm not the only person here 
on this discussion that uh, knows nothing other than uh, than consulting. So that's good to good to have uh, someone to commiserate with here. Um, another interesting uh, point here from um, Dallas on LinkedIn. Uh, Dallas says, "Unbridled passion and curiosity. Usually, it just falls into place if it's going to work." And I, I think that's really well said. I like uh, the, the concept or the, the phrase unbridled passion and curiosity. I think that's something you have to have as a consultant if you want to be good at it. Um, if you ever stop losing or if you ever lose that passion for for uh, just learning and you lose that curiosity, and if you ever get to the point where you feel like you have all the answers and you're done learning, then you should probably stop being a consultant at that point is, is my opinion. If I ever, I've always told myself, if I ever feel like I'm getting bored with consulting or I'm not curious, I'm not listening, I'm not trying to understand anymore. If I feel like I'm too smart or smarter than everyone I'm consulting to and it's not worth it, then I, I should just stop consulting because I'm not going to be good at it at that point, in my opinion. I think that's a really important part of consulting is to have that uh, passion and curiosity. So thank you for that that feedback, uh, Dallas. Um, another uh, just quick more of a question here from um, Schellender on LinkedIn. And I apologize, I'm probably going to mispronounce many people's names today if I haven't already. So um, Schellender, Schellender um, on LinkedIn asked the question, is formal technology education or such academic credentials a prerequisite for being a technology consultant? Um, I'd say yes and no. I mean, it certainly is one path. I mean, if you have technology credentials and academic credentials, it doesn't hurt by any means, but that's not the only path to get there. There's a lot of other ways you can become an effective technology consultant. Um, I mentioned a moment ago that I actually resisted the idea of becoming a technology consultant because I thought of myself more as a, a strategy and business consultant. I went and got my master's degree in business and I thought I was going to be more of like a operation strategy, um, organizational strategy sort of consultant. And it took me a while to figure out and realize that I'm actually am a strategy consultant. I actually am an organizational consultant. I'm doing all the things that I wanted to do but on the surface, I'm a tech consultant um, and technology. You can't really separate technology nowadays from strategy or organizational strategy or operations and all that stuff. So technology just especially today is a part of all of that. But I think when you peel back the onion and, and really dig into what a consultant does uh, when you're a technology consultant, it's more business and organizational focused or it should be if you're if you're good at it, you should be more focused on organizational and operational and strategic aspects of consulting. Even if you're a deep technical person, you need to have that understanding. And so I think having the, there's other education or credentials you can develop or other skill sets you can develop to become an effective technology consultant. And a lot of those skill sets don't have a lot to do with technology. So for example, if you were to, we, we hire a lot of consultants and one thing that, that I, that I look for that actually stands out on resumes when I see resumes that come across my desk for candidates on our team is um, someone who has like a Lean Six Sigma background, if they're certified in Lean Six Sigma, doesn't really have a whole lot to do with technology, if anything to do with technology, but it's a skill set that's really important that's very transferable into tech consulting. Because if you can understand operations and how to improve operations, be more efficient, be more lean and all that good stuff, you're just gonna, that gives you a good set, solid foundation to build on. And you can learn the technical stuff along the way. So I think that's, uh, something that's important to note too, is there's no one path to becoming a technology consultant, but the key is to understand where you can transfer some of your skills and backgrounds into becoming an effective technology consultant. And also just more fully understanding what a technology consultant really is. What does that really mean? I think too often consultants get a little myopically focused on an area of specialization and they don't really look beyond that. Um, and one of the questions I'm gonna to get to here in a moment is, balancing the need for specialization and digging deep and understanding an area very well versus having more of a breadth of understanding, more of a business and in general strategic understanding of how an organization works. Those are two different competing skill sets that you need to develop, not that you can't develop both or, or nurture both of those angles, both the specialization and the breadth. Over time, you can do both, but when you're getting started, oftentimes you have to specialize in an area just to just to get going or just to sort of build that niche for yourself. But even if you have that niche and that depth and that specialization, I would argue it's very important to have a breadth of, of knowledge to back that too. So I think that the good news of that is it gives you a lot of options for how you might get into consulting. The key though, in terms of getting in front of hiring decision makers and 
consulting firms that might hire you, the key is to figure out how to make sure you clearly transfer or articulate how your skill set and your background is uniquely positioned to help you be a better consultant. So that would be my my one caveat to that is there's a lot of different paths you can use to get to consulting, but you just want to make sure you position it in a way that that's going to appeal to decision makers that are um, hiring, whether you're trying to become part of a consulting firm or whether you're a, an independent one man or one woman consultant that's trying to sell your services to to another organization. So another interesting comment here from uh, Laik again on, on LinkedIn, uh, working as an ERP developer was boring, so I wanted to keep it interesting by following my passion for consulting. Um, if I were ever a developer, I would probably share that same sentiment. I was never a developer, but um, I would be a terrible developer just to be candid. So you don't want me touching code or being a developer because that just wouldn't be wouldn't be fun for anyone. But I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I'm in the same boat. And uh, if I had been a developer, I, I probably would have moved into consulting. But I think being a developer, though, having that deep technical experience is just a unique angle that you can really use to your advantage. Because now when you start talking about more general functional consulting, or if you become more of a business process or organizational consultant, having that technical understanding is really helpful. And in one of the interesting stories that happened early in my career, and it's one of those moments in life where you, at the moment you think it's a terrible thing, but then you look back and realize that that was actually a really good thing that happened, was that I was working for Pricewaterhouse and, and the partner I worked for at Pricewaterhouse um, sent me to a six week uh, SAP certification course. So I became, and I still am technically certified in SAP. I don't tell a lot of people that because third stage consulting is independent technology agnostic. We're not affiliated with SAP. We do a lot of stuff other than SAP. In fact, most of our work is non SAP, although quite a bit of it is SAP nowadays, but still that partner sent me to get certified in SAP. Um, the SAP R3 at the time was the, the software. And so I was certified in material management and production planning. So I was more on the manufacturing side and that was just the area that they, they wanted me to go get certified in. I didn't really, I didn't choose that and I didn't want to do it. Cause I thought, why would I do this? If I'm going to be a, what I wanted to be was an organizational change consultant. And I'm really glad I did it because I was the only change management consultant at that time on the teams I worked on early on that had been certified in SAP and they didn't ask me to do configuration. I never really spent a lot of time building software and that sort of thing, but just knowing the guts of how SAP worked and how the software we're deploying works was really helpful in, in a change management capacity because I had a lot more credibility. I could speak to the technology. I understood it better. And in some ways I understood operations better, um, especially at that point in my career, I was young and, you know, 24 years old or whatever I was, and I hadn't had much, if any real world manufacturing experience and that sort of thing. But through that certification, I sort of learned, um, how material management and MRP and production planning and just general manufacturing worked. And so when I would do change management for manufacturing clients, I just had that, you know, more, a more immediate understanding than that, than most people at that point in their careers. So I think, um, really understanding, maybe, you know, leveraging some of the skills you have. I think most people here listening in or, or being part of this conversation probably have some more relevant skills than you might realize that can be transferable into consulting. And hopefully we'll get to some more examples of that uh, as we go here. Um, here's an interesting question from uh, Dale on LinkedIn. He asked the question of how do I get from zero clients to one plus clients? Um, and I would say, having now started two consulting firms and run two different consulting firms over the last 17 years or whatever I've been doing this for um, on my own, um, getting the first one is typically the hardest, um, getting that first client, but then, you know, building a client base beyond one is another, you know, big milestone as well. So I think the key is really, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can market yourself or get your, get your services out there, certainly through networking now with technology like LinkedIn and um, other social networking tools. Um, it's a lot easier now than when I started my career to, to find that business and to get started. Um, when I started my previous company back in 2005, I relied heavily on writing blogs. I just started a blog in 2005, right when I started that company, which now doesn't sound that crazy or that innovative. But at the time, there wasn't anyone blogging about the stuff that I was blogging about, which was ERP and how to be successful in ERP. And that blog became very popular over the years. And then over time, other, you know, other consultants and 
B2B organizations started blogging and it became more common. And now it's no big deal to have a blog. Everyone has a blog. Uh, but at the time, that was a way to sort of differentiate myself and, and, and position myself as a, as a thought leader and someone that people could turn to for advice. And then when I started third stage back in 2018, I shifted my strategy a bit and focused more on video. And so that's where I started my YouTube channel. Um, I already had the YouTube channel, but I rarely posted videos. Um, so I just started posting videos ad hoc or sort of erratically on, on YouTube. And then I realized that it was getting traction. And then I, you know, I stepped up the production quality and frequency of the videos to where now I'm publishing almost every day. There's new videos uh, showing up on my YouTube channel. So um, that's just one example or two examples of ways you can position yourself, but you don't have to be on video. You don't have to be um, writing. You could also present at conferences. It could be just more networking, but anything you do to establish credibility and get in front of uh, get in front of potential clients is something that can be very, very helpful. We're here chatting about what it's like to be inside the mind of a technology consultant. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 113. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. Be sure to check us out there. We're here talking about this whole topic of inside the mind of a tech consultant. Let's jump back into the conversation. Mark from LinkedIn has some in an interesting comment here. He says, very similar experience here. Love the new challenges and learning new fields while doing similar work, but I also really enjoy helping people. And that's actually a really good point. That's something that um, I overlooked in my opening comments about why I love consulting or why someone might want to be a consultant is if you genuinely like helping people and hel helping organizations, it's, it's super rewarding in that regard. And it and that's another one that took me a while to realize in my career as a consultant is that you're not just doing you're not just doing a task within a statement of work, which I think, you know, we all have to do as consultants, you have to have a statement of work that clearly defines what it is you're going to do, what deliverable a client's going to get, how much it's going to cost, all that stuff. You have to obviously have that clarity. But when you really look under the surface of what you're really providing to clients, oftentimes it's not the deliverable that's in the statement of work. And I'm not suggesting that you should just go do whatever you want and get out of scope and spend the client's money or build the client as much as you want. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is there's a, there's an art to it that can't be captured in a statement of work. And one of the art, the art pieces of consulting, in my opinion, is helping people um, and maybe just to frame it a little bit differently or, or phrase it a little bit differently. I'd argue that being an effective consultant requires you to be an effective amateur therapist because so much of what you do as a consultant, is understand and empathize what organizations are going through. Because when you're called in as a consultant, you're typically brought in because there's some sort of business challenge or opportunity that the organization can't figure out themselves because they don't have the skill set or the bandwidth or leadership or whatever it is. And so they bring you into a situation to help. And usually when you're coming in to help, the organization is going through some sort of change, some sort of transformation that is stressful in a lot of ways. It might be exciting. There might be a lot of business value to be untapped or to, to be tapped into or unlocked, but there's still pain that goes along with that. And so you have to understand the pain. You have to understand the chaos. You have to understand the, the crazy things that people do when they're going through change and when they get stressed out. And so really helping people and helping and knowing that you can make an organization better than it was before they engaged you as a consultant is super rewarding. And there's also, you know, quite frankly, I'll just be honest, there's also a perceived 
an elevated perception of credibility with consultants, regardless of whether you're smarter than than a client or or you know more than a client, which you may, as a consultant, you may know more in your area of expertise, which is why they're hiring you. Um, but such a big part of that is um, is just the outside perspective gets valued more. There's there's so many times, I can't tell you how many times where I've been in a room and I'm presenting something to a client and it's exactly what, some of those things are exactly what their own employees had told them or the, what their own employees think. But because I'm an outside consultant and I say the same things, it just has more credibility. It has more weight. People believe it more because, you know, you're not tied up in all the internal politics. They perceive you to be, a, you know, an outside expert. That's great. That's flattering. But sometimes I feel kind of bad because it's like you paid me all this money to tell you something that your employees already knew or they already sort of, you know, um, their instincts were already telling them to be the case. Um, now, certainly when it comes to execution, especially, um, that's where consultants can add a ton of value because most organizations don't know how to execute really well. And so providing that consulting, um, ability to execute is something that's super uh, valuable too, it's super important. So if you like helping people, uh, consulting is a great way to look at it or a great career to pursue, I should say. Great comments here. Thank you for all the feedback and, and questions here. Um, this is from Carl on LinkedIn. Carl says, good point, Eric. Good point, Eric. Yeah, I even mispronounced my own name. So there you go. That that helps me feel better about mispronouncing everyone else's. I can't even pronounce mine right. Um, good point, Eric. Businesses need Business needs today require technology. Doing things on the back of an envelope no longer works. So that is very true. Um, any sort of, uh, even if you want to be a strategy consultant or just a general business consultant, you're going to have to know technology. Um, and that was something I, it took me a while to figure out and learn even back in the late nineties. It's even more true today. I, I can't imagine trying to be a consultant without knowing technology. Cause you, I don't know how you, I don't, I don't even know how you would consult them without, without understanding some of these emerging technologies that are affecting so many organizations and providing so much, uh, opportunity to organizations. So here's a really interesting question that I love here. This is from uh, someone named first is last on YouTube. This person says, hey there, I'm from South Africa. I was wondering if someone from a business analysis background looking to transition to consulting, what should they look into concerning the transition? Well, I'd say, first of all, if you're a business analyst, you have a really strong core foundation for being a good consultant, or at least having a skill set that can help you be a good consultant. Um, anyone who's been a business analyst in terms of um, doing you know, detailed process design or even building software, you just have sort of a detailed understanding of business or technology or organizations in a way that a lot of people don't have. And so I think, first of all, highlighting some of those skills that you've captured and some of the strengths you may have as a business analyst in a way that frames yourself or positions yourself to be a really strong potential consultant can be something that can be highly effective in, in uh, helping you break into consulting. So. I'd say you're on the right track. If you're a business analyst, leverage those skills, highlight those skills, showcase those skills, and then look to, you know, what could you do to augment or add to that business analyst background to make you a, a better consultant, whether it's more technical knowledge or maybe knowing a little bit more about organizational change or whatever the uh, case may be. Program management is another one. If you can get PMP courses or PMP certification, those are other um, good skill sets and, and qualifications to have as well. Now, one thing I want to cover too, we've sort of talked about the positives of consulting, but I think it's worth talking about why would someone not want to be a consultant? And um, this is really important too. I think, you know, self-selecting out of the consulting field is just as important. If it's not a good fit for you, that's just as important as being able to self-select in if it if you are going to be good at it or it is something you, you're going to enjoy. So, you know, I'll give you some examples of scenarios I've seen where people don't like consulting. Um, in no particular order, some of the things that come to mind, and I'm curious to hear from all of you too, you know, what have you seen? Are, if there's things you don't like about consulting or you don't think you would like about consulting, I would love to hear. Or if you've hired consultants and uh, you've worked with consultants in the past, what are some of the things that you don't like about consulting or that you've seen others not like about it? I'd love to hear your feedback. But I'll start with this is just sort of my laundry list of things why or reasons why you might not like, might not like consulting. Um, one is if you don't like travel. Um, that's something that is actually strangely enough, becoming a real big problem for us recruiting right now 
is that there's just a lot of people out there that want to be consultant, but they just don't want to travel. They've, they've really bought into this work from home, work from anywhere mindset, which I get. And we've, we've always, even pre COVID, we at third stage have always had more of a hybrid model where yes, we're in an office. I'm in an office here today, as you can see behind me. Um, we have an office here that's kind of a hoteling situation where people, when they're not on the road, can come in the office. We collaborate, all that good stuff. Um, but we don't require people to be here Monday through Friday. We don't require travel Monday through Friday. Uh, people have flexibility, work from home, all that good stuff. So we, we do have a balance here. But like I mentioned before, having that in-person human interaction is so important, you know, to be able to collaborate more effectively, um, to be able to collaborate effectively amongst yourselves, but also with consultants. Um, I don't want to open a whole can of worms here, but my personal opinion is that the work from anywhere movement is overrated uh, and overstated. I think that so much human, human interaction, especially in consulting, is it needs to be in person, not because I'm old school, not because I don't believe in Zoom meetings and technology to, to do a lot of that work, because we, we use it very heavily. We use technology very heavily to collaborate, but that occasional in-person meeting, you just cannot, I don't care what anyone says, you cannot replicate that on a Zoom meeting. The sidebar conversations, the walking the shop floor, talking to people, side conversations, all that stuff, the really important nuances of understanding a client as a consultant needs to be in person to some degree. And people that don't like to travel aren't probably going to like consulting. And some people just don't like travel because they've got kids or they're at that point in life where they just don't want to travel. So travel in consulting is not nearly as glamorous as it sounds. I think a lot of people think that's really cool. You get to stay in nice hotels and eat fancy meals and go to glamorous cities. But in reality, most of the time I'm traveling, I'm in a rural town in a, in a courtyard Marriott. Nothing wrong with courtyard Marriott. I actually love courtyard Marriott's. But you're at a courtyard Marriott eating, you know, takeout not eating well, you know, tr trying to struggle to get a workout in all that stuff. So it's not, it's not nearly as glamorous as it sounds. I love it. I do love traveling. I love going to all parts of the world, no matter where it is and experiencing new things. But if you don't like that, then you're not going to like travel um, or you're not going to like consulting, I should say. So travel is one thing. If you don't like to constantly learn, if you feel like you need to master something and sort of get comfortable in that master, that mastery of something, then consulting is probably not for you because my opinion is that cons the worst consultants are the ones that stopped learning and they gave up on learning. They, they have all the answers. They're the smartest people in their profession and they don't need to learn anymore. And when you have that mentality, I think it's time to check out and go do something else uh, because that means you're not listening. You're not, you're not trying to understand uh, the nuances of, of an individual client and you're coming in with a predefined answer based on, based on your experience. And I've seen a lot of consultants that get to like the point I am, or maybe even a little bit further in their careers where they've been doing it for so long. It's like, you know, they, they know, they know business and technology like the back of their hands and they just stop listening and they stop learning. Um, and usually it's not, you know, because they're arrogant or pompous, although sometimes it is, uh, usually it's because they really do think they've learned all there is to learn. And, and I think that's a dangerous place to be as a consultant. So if you don't like to learn, if you get stressed out by constant unpredictability, uh, you're probably not going to like consulting. Um, consulting can be stressful too, because you're often the scapegoat. There's a lot of pressure on you because you were brought in to fix a problem that a company couldn't figure out themselves. And in many cases they failed at, and in many cases people got fired over. Now they're going to hire you to come in and fix that problem that other people paid the price for not being able to do well. And with that comes a lot of stress and a lot of unpredictable client behavior, I'd say, you know, there's a lot of CIOs and um, CFOs and end clients we work with that sometimes they just, they get frustrated, they, they're stressed out and they take it out on you as consultants. And, it, and, and it's easy to take it personally. I used to take it very personally, but then I realized, you know what, it's not, this isn't directed at me, even though it feels like it's directed at me for a moment. What the real problem is, is that they are stressed out, they're under pressure and I need to understand how to make them feel better. And so it gets back to that whole point of being a, sort of an amateur therapist and being able to listen and understand what are they really saying? What's making this person tick and how can I make them feel better? And I, I'd argue that close to half of being an effective consultant is making your client feel good. Um, yes, you have to deliver what's in your statement of work and have reasonable billing and business value to prove that you're worth the, the amount of money you bill, but you, th that art of consulting is really listening and understanding and empathizing and knowing that this isn't personal, this is business and, uh, if someone gets mad at me, for example, I don't, I don't, I rarely take it personally. It is hard for me. I'll be honest, but, um, I, I try not to as, as best as I can. So those are some reasons why not to be a consultant. I'd love to hear though from, from you all, what are some other reasons why 
someone might not want to be a consultant. Um, one last thing I'll kind of throw in is if you like real steady, predictable work, um, consulting is not a good fit for that because consulting is sort of, uh, you're, you're, you're following the, the changes in the market. You're following the changes in businesses and they're hiring you to come in and solve a unique problem. So every project's going to be a little bit different. And if you don't like that, then you're probably not going to like consulting because that's just how it is. And that's the nature of consulting. But what, what do you all think? I'm curious to hear what, what you, what you don't like about consulting or some of the things that you think would be a negative, uh, about consulting. And I'm going to go back to the chat stream here and see you what comments you have about that. Another comment from like on, on LinkedIn is if you're a loan or a founder, in my opinion, partnering with the right people can be a good strategy. Totally agree with that. Um, great point. Um, we partner with a lot of, uh, independent solo contractor type consultants that enjoy being contractors. We have some people that start off as contractors and then become employees. We have some people that we hire as W2 or, or full-time employees. And then we have other people that just really have no desire to, to be an employee per se. And what's interesting, and, and that's another thing, we don't take that personally. We think, okay, if you like this contractor model, you like the flexibility, you like being self-employed, let's partner and figure out a way to work together. Um, and what's interesting is most of the people that are in that situation where they just enjoy being contractors and have no desire to be an employee, they're only doing work for third stage in, in like 90% plus of the time, just because we have so much work and they're able to help in so many different ways. So it's sort of like best of both worlds. You get to be part of a bigger team, part of something bigger than yourself. You get to be part of projects that are bigger than what any one person can do. But at the same time, you still have that flexibility and that, that sort of ownership of being self-employed and whatnot. So um, depending on the firm, I mean, some firms don't hire contractors, some firms only hire contractors, but then they want you to be sort of a, a lone wolf out on consulting engagement. So, uh, for us at third stage, we, we try to blend the best of both, you know, to pull together employees and contractors that are the right fit for a client, put them together as a cohesive team and, uh, you know, do great work for our clients. So great point there about that. Another interesting comment from Dallas here. You are representing your client under that agreement. You must be like water. Uh, interesting point. Well, well said. Um, Carl, Carl makes a comment here back to the question about how to market yourself or how to get your first client or clients. Uh, Carl says, seems like a mix of referrals, blogs, LinkedIn, videos, speaking engagements, et cetera, is important to track clients. I'd say that's absolutely true. Any, any mix, any of the above, any mix of those combinations of things, um, can be very important. Um, you know, certainly part, the partnership strategy is a good one that, that I hadn't mentioned before, but that is a good one that the, um, the previous person had mentioned as well. Um, another comment here from, from Dallas, humility helps ground yourself because sometimes it could be a straight up rush. Um, that's well said. And the humility is super important too, by the way, that's a, that's not a word I've used yet here in this conversation, but I totally agree with that. If you can be humble and have that humility, you're going to be a better consultant because you first of all, you, you know that you don't have all the answers, which is really weird to say, because I think a lot of times people think that as a consultant, you should have all the answers. And I, and a lot of consultants, and by the way, a lot of the least effective consultants I've worked with in my career think they have all the answers. And, and I believe really strongly in this. In fact, it's something I try to vet out when I'm interviewing people. If I find that someone thinks they have all the answers, I'm probably not going to hire that person, even if they really do. It doesn't matter whether they really have the, all the answers or not, in my opinion. Uh, even in, in cases where I feel like I might have all the answers, I've seen this before with a certain client, I tell myself that I haven't um, because I'm trying to figure out, you know, how is this client different? How is this organization different? How is this person different? Um, or how is this group of people different? Um, how is this culture different? How is the potential solution for this potential client different? And no matter what you, you do or, or regardless of what someone might argue on this point, I, I believe strongly that every situation is different and you have to have an, an open mind and you have to be humble enough to know that, yes, I've seen a lot of this sort of thing before, maybe pieces of it and other examples, but this is the first time I've seen this exact situation with this combination of problems and this combination of culture and people and all that stuff. Um, and like I said, if you get to the point where you don't have that humility, you're going to come in with the answer predefined and you're going to miss something. You're going to you're going to create your own blind spots, which is very um, dangerous to do, in my opinion, as a consultant, especially if you're a smart person, there's no reason you should come in with a 
predefined answer that may may not be the right fit for a client. I think it's important to have that humility. And humility also gives you the potential to learn more too. If you if you tell yourself and if you know you don't have all the answers and you don't have everything all figured out, then you're just going to be more open to learning. And I think that's super important. And that's something that um, I try to do too. Even like in YouTube videos that I that I do on my YouTube channel, um, very popular YouTube channel. I get a lot of great feedback from people on my YouTube channel. And I think it adds a lot of value and which is why I keep doing it. I think a lot of people benefit from it. But every time I do a video, I'm learning something. And as I'm creating video or even as I'm doing a live discussion like this, I always learn something from other people. And, um, you know, there's people that will I've, I've gotten messages from people that say, you're awesome. I've learned so much from you. And I'll say, well, you're awesome. I learned so much from you because you were on my live stream and I picked up A, B and C from you. And so I think that's the the key is to really have that that sort of uh, that learning mindset and that that reminder to yourself that you don't have all the answers. Because, uh, like I said, egos and predefined answers are two of the most destructive, ineffective characteristics of of consultants. There's a lot of really good feedback here. I apologize for the silence here because there is a ton here. I'm trying to figure out um, where to go from here. Uh, create your own blind spots. I love that. That's from Dallas on uh, LinkedIn. Thank you, Dallas. I'm glad, glad you like that. That's the first time I've used that phrase. So see, I just learned something by having this conversation. Consultants create their own blind spots. And now I can go make a whole video about that. And I can thank you all for giving me that, that idea. Um, Here's a really important two word comment here from Gassan uh, on LinkedIn. Gassan says emotional intelligence, super, super important. Um, I've had guests on my podcast on this live stream um, about emotional intelligence. I'm fascinated by that concept. And I think it's something that's uh, really, really important. It's one of the soft skills that are not highlighted enough when people go into consulting and when they get trained to become consultants. Too often training focuses on the hard skills, the tangible stuff which you need to have, but I'll take all day, every day, I will take someone who has less of a technical skill set, but more emotional intelligence. I'll take that person any day over someone that has more tangible, hard skills, but less emotional intelligence. And the reason is, is because the, the higher degree of knowledge completely gets undermined and watered down when you don't have the emotional intelligence to go along with it. So in, in essence, it's like you don't have the knowledge because you can't apply it effectively. So if I can find someone that has less knowledge, but they can apply it more effectively through their emotional intelligence, uh, I will take that person every time. And that's quite frankly, when I'm interviewing people, a lot of times, most of the time it's, I'm the last interview before they join our team. And all I look for is cultural fit. And I'm looking for emotional intelligence. I'm looking for those soft things. I, I do care to some degree about what you know and what experience you have and the tangible skill sets. Of course, that's important. But what I really look for is sort of that final decision point in our hiring process is emotional intelligence. Does this person listen? Do they ask good questions? Do they seem humble? Do they seem smart, but humble at the same time, which is a really hard combination to find, by the way. Um, and so that's, that's, um, you know, I think emotional intelligence is a really, a really good point. We're here chatting about what it's like to be inside the mind of a technology consultant. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more transformation ground control. Are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation? Then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 113. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. Be sure to check us out there. We're here talking about this whole topic of inside the mind 
of a tech consultant. Let's jump back into the conversation. Here's a question I want to get to that is not from the audience here today yet, from what I've seen, but it's a it's a question I get often on social media and just in conversations with consultants, which is uh, the question is, which is more important, specialization or breadth? So in other words, should I go focus on one module within one type of software and become a technical consultant that focuses just on that? Or should I learn multiple technologies, multiple modules, uh, multiple work streams within a digital transformation, whether it's change management or project management, whatnot? Um, and I'd say there's two different answers I give you. One is when you're starting out, oftentimes specialization is good because that gives you a way to create some sort of a critical mass in a comfort zone that you can build from. So you, if you try to start off too broad, that can be overwhelming. And it's not, in my opinion, it's just not effective to try to be good at everything when you start out. So if you pick an area like change management or program management or business analyst or a certain type of technology or certain vendor, uh, technology. Those are some examples of ways you might start to build some specialization. But what I would say is that, you know, mistake that a lot of consultants make is they stick to that specialization and don't look to broaden their skills. And so I would say whatever your specialization is, I would try to constantly be pushing the boundaries of your knowledge, not to spread yourself too thin and not to try and boil the ocean, but really just to learn more. And, you know, the more you learn about digital transformations and technology, the better you're going to be at it. And, for me personally, I'll just give you an example. I think I'm pretty good at change management. I think I'm pretty good at digital strategy, pretty good at software selection, program managing implementations. I'm really good at analyzing why an implementation fails because I've done so much expert witness work. So there's things like that that I know I'm really good at, but the things I'm not good at are things like uh, data migration. I'm just not good at that. I don't know a lot about it. And I'm trying to learn more and more over time, um, especially now with like artificial intelligence, machine learning and analytics and all the stuff that feeds from data management leads me to think that I need to know more about data management. So that's an area I'm constantly learning more about. Same with architecture, like system architecture and integration. Some of these more technical areas that I resisted so heavily early in my career. And now I'm find myself saying, I want to learn more about that because these are, these are my blind spots. These are my weaknesses. And that's why we have people on our team at third stage. They're much better at the technology stuff than I am, especially when it comes to architecture, data, um, data migration, integration, and all that stuff. So I think if you start off with specialization, if you're earlier in your career, you're probably going to lean more towards specialization. That's probably going to benefit you more. But as you advance in your career, I'd say breadth becomes more important. And for me, the ultimate person, the ultimate consultant is one that has all the positive characteristics I've talked about in terms of the emotional intelligence and the soft skills, but also someone who has a good combination of specialization and breadth. Um, I'm never going to find and I'm never going to be a consultant that knows everything about everything, but I can find people that know a lot about a lot of things and put them together into a team that provides a complete cohesive solution and a complete uh, comprehensive team that knows not everything, but no one knows everything, but knows a lot, can pretty much cover everything needed to be successful in a transformation. So that'd be my opinion on specialization versus breadth. But again, would love to hear uh, some of your thoughts here uh, too. One thing I want to, uh, before I turn back to audience questions too, on that thought and this thought too, I want to get to this, this next uh, sort of question or thread, which is really important because I also want to come at this from the angle of if you're not a consultant or you don't necessarily aspire to be a consultant, but you, you want to know how to manage consultants. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll broaden this question to be how to, I'll combine two questions into one here that I had. First question I had is what are some things to consider when choosing a potential consulting partner? And then this question that I put up on the screen is what are some tips for managing consultants? So I want to cover both of those things, um, things to consider when evaluating and then how to manage. And I think this is really important because if you're looking for ideas on how to find the best consulting partner, I think it is important to look at some of the tangible things we've been talking about here today so far, but it's equally important to look at some of the intangible aspects, the softer aspects of a consulting firm or a consulting team that might be a potential option for you. So for example, cultural fit, you want to hire a consulting firm that not only knows their stuff and is smart and has the skill set to apply to your transformation, but you also want someone that is a good cultural fit, someone that's not going to come in like a bull in a China shop and, and, and sort of wreck your culture or not fit into your culture. You need to hire someone who's sort of like a chameleon. They can sort of fit into different situations. And by the way, 
if you are a consultant looking for career advice, you also have to be a chameleon um, to be a good consultant. And if you're looking for consultants, I think you need to find those chameleons because you need people that adjust and adapt and understand. And at the same time, though, you want to know they've got experience and depth and can apply some of their lessons and experiences to your situation to be more effective and to help you be more effective. So I think that's something that's um, important to look at when you're evaluating consultants is the, the cultural fit. Um, also, just sort of the the overall approach and philosophy of the consulting firm or the consultant. Again, if it's someone that has too much of a cookie cutter approach, that's probably not a good idea. Um, even though it sounds good in theory, it generally doesn't work to come in with, with the answer. You can certainly come in with your tool set and have your toolbox and know that I've got these hundred different ways I could do things or that I've seen things work and maybe 30 or 40 of those tools in my toolbox are going to work here, but I know how to mix and match and when to pull and what to pull from that toolbox. And that's something that's really important to look for when you're evaluating or, or hiring consultants um, is that flexibility. And then certainly you want at the same time, though, you also want to know that they've got a methodology, they've got an approach, they've got a repeatable process, but you also want to see the flexibility within that to know that it's going to fit your, your situation. Um, and then the other thing too, that in my opinion is super important. It's the whole reason I started third stage consulting is independence. And so someone that's independent and not tied to the software vendors, someone who's not trying to sell you technology, someone that's not trying to sell you on one sort, certain type of technology is really important because bias is one of the killers in consulting. People that are biased that come in with a predefined answer either because that's all they know or even worse, it's because how they're paid, which is true for most of the consulting industry. Most consultants are paid somehow by software vendors to influence decision making through it. And, and it's not even just the software selection process, by the way. It's also even during implementation, it's just as prevalent in implementation. You get consultants that are biased, they're commissioned by software vendors. Their economic incentive is to grow the footprint of one certain technology as much as possible even if it's not the right fit for the organization. In today's day and age, it's rare to find any one technology that's gonna be the perfect fit for an entire organization. And so you wanna know you've got an advisor that's coming in and helping you execute, define and execute a strategy that makes the most sense for you and isn't influenced by a commission that's being received uh, or an incentive that's being received from the software vendors. And so that independence, lack of bias, in my opinion, is super important. And it's probably the one thing that's the most missing and the biggest problem in the tech consulting space is that bias. Um, I think that's a huge problem and it's part of why, why I started third stage, quite frankly, and it's something that really bothered me early in my career from the start. It bothered me that we were so biased and we were doing things that didn't feel like we're in clients best interest, even though clients were paying us to do so. But the problem was we also had competing, uh, competing clients essentially, which were the vendors who wanted you and expected you to go in and tow the company line as it relates to a certain technology or whatever the case may be. I remember when I first, um, the first software selection I was involved with at Price Waterhouse, I remember it was a, it was a fortune 500 company. It was here in the Denver area, which is where I'm based. Um, and they, the consulting engagement was for over a million dollars for us to come in and assess the operations and make recommendations on what the technological roadmap going forward would be. Sounds straightforward enough. We do that all the time here at Third Stage, right? We, we do these big evaluations for big complex companies, make recommendations, nothing wrong with that on the surface. But the problem was, and this is early, early in my career, within the first six months of being in it, in the consulting field. And I remember being fairly excited that I get to learn about all these different technologies we're going to evaluate and all this good stuff. And it turns out that um, we knew from day one that our recommendation was going to be SAP because we had a big SAP practice and we had a tight partnership with SAP. Uh, in the office I worked out of, and it just felt weird that we were getting paid a million dollars to come up with the answer that we already we already had the answer. Um, we just had to figure out how to justify the answer. Um, I don't know if the client knew that or you know how important that was to the client at that time, but I just knew that I started asking questions like, why is that? How is that okay? And it was highly frowned upon. Uh, and I learned very quickly um, through negative reinforcement at at that company that you don't ask questions. You don't question the machine. You don't question the way things are. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I sort of justified it in my own mind by thinking, well, that must just be this team I'm on, or that just must, must be this part of the organization I'm in. But then I learned that's just how the whole company works. 
then I realized it's not even just my company. The, the entire industry works that way. The entire industry is wired to promote certain products and to sort of come in with a hardened position on what the technological answers should be. And so that's really why I started the first company in 2005 that I started. And then third stage in 2018 was to uh, provide an independent alternative to, to some of these big consulting firms that were, um, you know, peddling solutions that may not have been good fits for clients. So I want to get to some some other questions here in these last few minutes, um, other than my own. Um, you know, here's I'm, I'm going to do sort of a lightning round and try and get real quick answers to as many of these as I can, just in the interest of time, because there's a lot I haven't gotten to. Uh, Carl on LinkedIn asks, what is the mix of client needs that, you're, that you encounter in the field for facilitation versus consulting? Um, I think that facilitation is very common. It's probably not as common as consulting per se. But I would argue that the facilitation piece of it enables a lot of the consulting because you're facilitating, you're getting inputs and understanding, and the better you can facilitate, the better you can then turn and consult. So you may spend less time doing facilitation, but it's a really important input into the broader uh, piece of consulting that you might might be doing there. Another uh, comment from... Uh, Shylander on LinkedIn says consultants may have to work across industries and sometimes consultants may be labeled as shallow or something lacking in depth or rigor. This may be challenging if your client point of contact is a domain expert in that industry. Great point. Um, that is something that's very true. If you have a, a highly specialized industry that your client is in and you don't have a lot of experience in that industry or there's a technical area that your client knows better, then there is a risk that you become perceived as inferior or not as high value. And so the key here is to, you know, I, I just embrace the weaknesses I have. I say, I'm not an expert in this area. Here's where I am an expert. Here's where you, Mr. or Mrs. Client, are an expert. Let's put our skill sets together to figure this out together. And I think as long as you do that and don't proclaim to have all the answers and to be better, to have more knowledge than a client, you're going to be fine. Most, most clients I work with understand when you say, I'm not an expert in this area. Here's where I am an expert. Here's where you can help us. And by the way, if neither one of us can figure this out, or don't have the skill set that we need, we have other team members we can bring in that do. So I think just having those sorts of options and those sort of candid conversations are an important part of consulting. And it's something that uh, it's something that builds trust too. I think a lot of times if, if you're human and you acknowledge what you do and don't know, um, people trust you more because you actually are human. You're not just trying to be a fancy consultant that has all the answers. Um, and I'm always amazed. And sometimes I'm still fascinated by the fact that um, I actually, I think I'm a fairly smart person, maybe slightly above average, but that has nothing to do with why I'm a good consultant or why I think I'm a good consultant. I think I'm a good consultant because I know what I'm not good at and I'm okay admitting it. And I ask a lot of questions and I try to understand, and I know that every client situation is different. And I, I think I'm pretty good at empathizing with clients. So it's that sort of thing that, uh, I think is really important to becoming a good consultant. All right. Thank you everyone. Really appreciate your help and your participation in that conversation. Great questions, great commentary great additional thoughts that I hadn't thought of uh, as we were going through that conversation. So really appreciate everyone's involvement there and uh, encourage you to keep leaving comments in the, in the chat here in the comments of this uh, podcast, because I'd love to hear what, what feedback you have. If you happen to be watching this after, uh, after the stream and you'd like to share your comments, I'd love to hear them. I, I do go back and read them. So be sure to leave them uh, on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or on the audio podcast platforms, wherever you're listening or watching here today. So uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back from a break, we're going to shift gears, and I'm going to turn it over to actually play you a clip from a event that we hosted about three years ago now, or close to three years, maybe it was two and a half years ago. It was an online digital event right in the height of the COVID lockdowns, and it was an online event we did because we couldn't do it in person. So we, we did an online workshop, and one of the topics we covered in that workshop was digital transformation quality assurance and why having an independent digital transformation quality assurance advisor is so important, what it means, what that framework should look like, all that stuff we're going to talk about. And in this clip, I'm, I'm part of this conversation and part of the presentation, as well as Stuart Robb from our UK office uh, for Third Stage Europe, as well as Marcus Harris, who's a third-party software attorney. He's been on this podcast many times as a guest, as a direct interview guest, but in this case, he was, he was co-presenting with Stuart and I, uh, Marcus Harris is a uh, attorney at Taft Law in North America. So you have uh, Marcus and I from North America, Stuart from the UK. We're all talking about the same thing, though, which is quality assurance and digital transformation. 
So we're going to uh, play you that clip when we come back. But first, we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 113. My name is Eric Kimberling. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check us out, check out past episodes. We have 112 previous episodes where we cover tons and tons of stuff that you may have missed if you, if you haven't seen those previous episodes. So I encourage you to go back and check it out. I've got a playlist on my YouTube channel that has all the previous episodes. And obviously, if you're, you're listening on an audio podcast platform, you can find all the previous episodes in the app under the Transformation Ground Control listing. So I'm going to shift gears and play you a clip of a presentation that myself and two colleagues did a couple years ago. Uh, Stuart Robb, who is part of Third Stage UK, uh, or Third Stage Europe in UK, as well as Marcus Harris, who's an attorney that works for Taft Law. The three of us give a presentation about digital transformation quality assurance, as well as how to assess the health of your digital transformation. So we thought it'd be a great um, thing to share with you here today. It's something that we haven't released publicly other than to those who attended the, the live online events, we thought it'd be good to dust that off and, and play you this clip because it's a very timeless clip, in my opinion, in that no matter how technology changes, this quality assurance concept is something that stands the test of time and provides project governance and risk management to ensure that your digital transformation is successful, sort of an insurance policy of sorts. So why don't we play the clip and uh, see what you think? So, um, I mean, this might sound obvious, but different people have different views of what we mean by um, assurance, uh, quality assurance. Um, and um, really what you're trying to do is look at um, whether or not your, your likelihood of a successful outcome, basically. And a, a successful outcome is that the software gets implemented on time, on budget, to the right level of quality and realizes the benefits that you've set out um, when you started out. And then the other spin on that is uh, about how you execute that. So are you being efficient and effective um, throughout the life cycle of your project? Um, and therefore, uh, have you got any way of recognizing through that life cycle whether there are material problems? And that's really what assurance is about. It's about um, a process whereby um, either you have your own quality team or you bring in um, some quality experts to come and look at the program and spot the things that you haven't spotted and see whether or not there's any material risk to your program that's going to cause it to be um, fatally derailed. Um, and really what we're trying to do is to get to the bottom of the difficult questions. There's a list of um, four questions there. There are actually dozens, dozens of difficult questions, um, but one we've actually just talked about. We talked about is the SOW robust enough in, I would say, 90% of all SOWs that I've read that have been written by the suppliers, they are nowhere near leading practice. They are very heavily biased in their favor um, and don't give you a proper mechanism to track where you are. And we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Um, is the program really on track? Um, it's a very difficult thing to work out. You might be getting status reports and they might be saying green or they might be saying amber and you might get a lot of verbals, but uh, actually very few status reports really tell you the holy trinity of things you need to know, which is based on the, the, the time spent and the deliverables produced uh, and the SI effort expended is the plan uh, and the estimate um, uh, tracking against the actuals. Um, and actually, um, it's very rare to find that unless you force an SI into a position 
where they're doing that planning and estimating and reporting it, they will give you that holy trinity view. A third one uh, that's really common, um, uh, uh, an SI will say, we've completed our blueprint, we've completed our design, we're ready to get building. Um, but the question is, how do you know design is complete? What is it that about that milestone that you can say, yeah, we've thought everything through, we've worked it all out, we know exactly how we want it to work, and we're ready to go and start construction. Um, and then the final one that's frequently, uh, again, um, we come comes up over and over again when we do assessments. Um, artifacts are um, emailed around. Um, they kind of lose their momentum and their focus, so they never get properly signed off. They never get properly quality assured. They go into some directory somewhere, uh, and people lose sight of them. Um, and uh, in fact, in many instances, the artifacts or the work packages are not even defined in the SOW. So they they literally they come along. Uh, the data migration approach and strategy will come along. It will get sent to someone. Someone will have a look at it. Um, and then it'll get shoved in a directory and that's the last time anyone will ever read it unless you know, actually at the point of litigation in which case the attorneys will be getting all of those documents out of the directories and starting to read them properly. So that's what we try and do through the process. We try and ask those questions before you're really in the meat of it or whilst you're going through the program at specific insertion points rather than where Marcus gets involved which is when the whole thing has turned into a catastrophe and, and, and they're asking the difficult questions at the end. And so what we do is we produce a risk assessment. Um, we try and value the risks if we can. Um, it's not always very easy to value intangible risks. We try and put a, a variance analysis on where you are in terms of your budget. Um, and we provide obviously a set of uh, recommended and remedial actions. So that is a long explanation, but that's really what we're trying to get out of assurance. Okay, any comments from anyone moving on? Um, so why do we do assurance? So you, pro you, you have heard this a lot. We do talk about it a lot. Um, I think I have the most comprehensive list of ERP cock-ups, um, uh, which is my page on the right-hand side. Um, this is all of the cock-ups that have made the, um, made the news newspapers. Um, so if you think of that list as a list of just the ones that we know about that were big enough or created enough collateral damage to get into the press, you can multiply that by probably a factor of 50 um, to think about all the ones that were um, impaired in some way that didn't make the press. Um, and there are some big names in there. I mean, we've mentioned uh, Lidl um, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, I was personally involved uh, with a couple of them. In fact, in my, Travis Perkins, um, I was actually on the remediation team and some of these programs just get to a point that they are fatally compromised and can't be remediated. The MFI one um, is an interesting one um, because that one went, that was an SAP one, that one went so horribly wrong that they had to do a cash call to the city because they couldn't fulfill customer orders and it ended up sinking the company. They're now no longer in existence. They've taken over by a firm called Howden's in the UK. So, you know, these do have, um, you know, big impacts. Um, and um, even the very best program director or program manager uh, on the client side can't be everywhere at once. And he might be spotting a problem over here you know, to do with something regarding uh, business engagement, and he will lose sight of what's happening with the SI, or he will be going um, hard on the SI, and then he will lose something on the organizational change management side. So the other thing that assurance does is it gives you a bit more bandwidth to allow you to look at the whole program at a helicopter level. Yep. So um, usually there's a trigger um, for uh, the uh, assurance um, and the, that trigger is usually when someone in the program has realized that it's already broken. Um, by the way, if anybody wants to know what this odd background is, I'm an ex-mainframe systems programmer and I try and get at least one slide like this into every presentation, so an IBM mainframe systems console. Um, but if we go through the, if we go through the, 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 the inventory of triggers, um, it, it's quite often that you will find 
that you will get a you start to drift and you'll start to lack uh, getting clear operational direction. A lot of that comes from um, experience of the very senior leadership of a program. If they haven't done ERP programs before, and it's quite common that someone out of the business will be appointed as the program director or ERP sponsor. Um, they will not realize what is going wrong until it comes quite a lot too late down the process. Um, the second one that's very popular, uh, again, uh, the vendor or integrator will take over your program so that they, they, you will stop being in control of your own destiny and they will start running it for you. Um, and the usual early warning sign for that is who is writing the weekly status reports. Very frequently, you'll find the, you'll go in and find the vendor is writing the status reports, and we've already talked about um, string along fraud, where um, you might not be getting the same status uh, presented to you as the uh, as the vendor might be actually managing internally. Yeah, that, um, that to me, uh, that that's a, just a huge red flag for me. I mean, every every time you, in almost every one of these cases, you'll see a situation where there was a flip from control of the project being managed by the customer to control being managed by the vendor. And that to me is just one of the biggest red flags that we see in litigation. So um, yeah, it's a good, good point. And it's funny you highlight that because of one of the questions that was coming in as you were speaking, Stuart, or one of the comments was that I was, it says I was once told that when you engage a firm for assurance, you should ensure you select one that can take over a project if needed. Thoughts on this? You can imagine where this came from. So it almost sounds like that this is a, uh, you know, an, another big five or big system integrator saying, hey, we'll do quality assurance, but we can also take over the entire thing for you. And it's uh, it's awfully appealing to think that, you know, you get one throat to choke and I can just outsource this whole thing to someone else. But that's a common problem that runs in, that creates a lot of problems later on. Well, I mean, it, it actually goes even worse than that. I mean, some organizations um, have actually devolved their accountability for running the whole program to the SI because they've stated up front, we don't know how to run these programs, therefore we are giving you um, the full control of the helm. Um, uh, and that's like letting the poacher, uh, sorry, that's like um, the poacher giving the gamekeeper his gun. Um, I mean, it is a fatal mistake and it happens very, very frequently. Yeah. Um, so obviously, um, uh, another thing that causes a trigger, you, you get a backlog of business operational decisions and they are what I call the how is this going to work decision that starts slowing the whole progress of the program down because um, in fact I read a blog on this a, a year or so ago about having done your homework before you get the consultants on site and it's so important because as soon as you they go how do you want this to work and you go mm, we don't know we might go and have a workshop and find it out they are still on the meter while you're trying to work that out and some things you need their help for but actually a lot of the business ways of working are things that you can do much cheaper with a much smaller set of consultants before all of the configuration team and a test team and everyone else all gets on site starting to ramp your meter up. Um, I would say probably, well, the over budget one, the slipping deadlines, the low quality or missing artifacts. Um, it's surprising how often um, organizations don't realize that they're slipping or they're over budget. And the reason for that will be because as far as the payment schedule goes, the payment schedule will be broadly invoicing the right amount every month. So you'll be going, great, well, we must be on schedule. Well, what's actually happening is they're spending more money on delivering the artifacts and that's only going to become manifest later down the process um, so effectively they're burnt they're over burning on earlier parts of the program but the amount being built looks right so unless you've got a very 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 clear alignment between the effort the si is expended and the deliverables that they are producing and the time spent, the schedule, there is no way you can know if the invoice looks right, whether or not you're on track or you're overspending. And what we see quite often is that that will come obvious only far too late down the process when the project is starting to run out of money, but some key stage gates or key milestones are actually still not been met. Stuart, do, that, you use, do you use earned value to track that? Do you recommend that? Yes. 
just an excellent point. I'd actually written it down and forgot to mention it. Yes. Um, uh, you can mitigate against that using earned value reporting. But in order to do earned value, you have to know what deliverables they were producing and how much effort they had planned to spend producing each deliverable. You don't know though, at least those two variables, you can't do earned value management. And, and I've seen project plans um, which are reporting progress by elapsed time. So 60% of this particular task is complete because it was due to run um, six weeks and we've completed four weeks, therefore we must be 60% through the task. Well, that's not a value of earned value. That's just a, uh, that's just a, 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 a re representation of time. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the last two probably, are, and I will speed up in a minute because we, 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 I don't want to overrun this, but a um, uh, very common factor is that many organizations try to take on much, much, much too much scope in the early phases. Um, and I have a little saying for this, overambition leads to underachievement. Um, and there's usually an overambition of expectations that have partly been set by the salesman trying to sell you the product. Or the, or the solution, um, and partly because your own internal ambition wants those benefits faster in order to realize the ROI. Uh, and therefore you'll get set unrealistic targets or unrealistic budgets. You know, we want our ERP implemented in nine months, that's it. Um, and it, it can't be done. And when you change the argument, here it becomes a bit easier to realize because when you're implementing an ERP solution you're really not implementing a piece of technology that's a byproduct what you're actually doing is changing people's jobs and the way that they work and people change is much more difficult to do than it is to put a new piece of technology and I mean Eric will tell you this because I am the worst person in the world to use any technology that third stage uses um, because I am a change dinosaur um, so, uh, um, but that's because I've been doing things in a particular way for 20 years. And so you want me to change that, you have got to put a lot of effort into the organizational change management. And most businesses don't understand that. They don't plan for that. And they start to fail because the business cannot absorb the amount of change that's trying to be imposed on them by a new technology. We heard playing you a clip of Stuart, Rob, Marcus, Harris, and I presenting a presentation about digital transformation quality assurance. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation? Then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 113. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on audio podcast platforms throughout the world, as well as LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Be sure to check us out wherever you prefer to like or listen or watch, I should say. We're in the midst of a conversation here with Stuart Robb, Marcus Harris, and myself talking about digital transformation quality assurance. Let's jump back into the conversation. Should, when should we do assurance? Well, the, obviously the, um, the, the right answer is um, you should build your assurance um, as part of the DNA of your transformation right from the beginning. And the reason for that is because actually most transformations go wrong at the beginning. And because they're not structurally set up right, they're structurally impaired, that problem becomes a seed, a, a cancer on the program effectively, that it, it effectively fatally undermines it. Um, 
And so some of those reasons that we've mentioned, overambitious scope, overly optimistic budget, poor requirements, poor contracts that Marcus talked about, wrong people or lack of experience, resources and key roles, those are all startup problems. <clears throat> and if they are startup problems, they are going to continue to be problems until somebody, usually the sponsor is spending their money, realizes that they've started it up wrong, that their contracts are terrible, that they've set miles to over ambitious goals, and then you're into recovery. And recovering a program is much, much harder than it is setting it up right and keeping it navigating on the right path. Um, Gartner did a, a study that said that something like um, three and four ERP projects fail to realize their stated goals in some form or the other. They read the run over budget, they uh, run over time, they don't realize the benefits or they get cancelled. When you're in remediation, a, a, a rule of thumb, having looked at some stats on this, is that if you have to go into remediation, your chance of recovering from a remediation is about one in 10. So that means nine in every 10 projects that say, we're in trouble, we need to get someone in to help, actually um, end up failing anyway. So remediation is a very, very bad place to get to. And a lot of times you don't even, you, you don't see, if you're not experienced in this, you don't see or feel the need for remediation until it's too late. I mean, by the time you start to see some of these smoke signals or smoke signs, um, usually by then it's, it's often too late. And I, and I think on your point, Eric, I mean, and it's not necessarily your fault that you're not seeing that. I mean, the, the, the way, and, and Stuart talked to this a little bit ago, the way these status reports and just your interaction is, is, is set up with your, your systems integrator, you know, you're, you're not supposed to see it necessarily, right? I mean, you're, you're supposed to think that everything is going well. And, you know, on the back end, they're, they're you know, push, pushing all these resources, trying to right side the project. You have no idea. I mean, I was in a lawsuit um, actually with Eric and opposing counsel was trying to make everything, dismiss everything. He said, look, you know, all this stuff that's happening in the back, that's like, that's like the chaos that goes on in a restaurant. Um, you know, but you're, you're at the front, you're at the table getting prepared uh, or eating a nice meal that's been prepared you know, by the chef. But you, know, you don't want that chaos at all. There, there, sh there, there shouldn't be any chaos. Um, but too often there is. And, and, and most often, I think, you know, it's, it's being hidden from you. So yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah. And on the, the flip side of that, I'll ask a, actually a very relevant question. There's a ton of questions coming in, by the way, guys. So at any point we want to open up conversation, there's a lot. Um, but one of them that's kind of running maybe the, the flip side of what you just said, Marcus, and what you said, Stuart, is the comment is my concern with assurance is that there's pressure to have findings, negative findings, because these have a high appearance of value. I've never seen the one that came out without an indictment. Thus, both the SI and the key leaders and the PMO become targets of the assurance team. Thoughts on this? If I'm a client leader, how do I protect myself? It's a really good question. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So well, I don't know what your guys' thoughts are, but I think that the key there is, I mean, first of all, you have to find an assurance partner that's reasonable. And I think the big thing, in my opinion, I'd be curious to see what Stuart and Marcus, what you guys think. I, I think you have to look at the ulterior motive, potentially, of the quality assurance partner, because if you bring in... We see this a lot where, let's just say Deloitte is doing the implementation, Accenture is coming in to do the QA, and QA is going to try and destroy Deloitte to try and come in and take over the project. So, of course, yeah. so you have to kind of watch if you have something to gain by taking over the entire project and putting 100 people on your project, there, there's going to be an incentive to, to put a bullseye on you and your team and your current system integrator. So I think you just have to find someone that's reasonable and in my opinion, someone like Third Stage who's independent, we don't do system integration work, so we're not trying to win system integration work. Um, sure. Something like that or someone with that lack of bias uh, can be one way to do it. But what are your guys' thoughts on that? I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And, and you're just going to be beating down things and you're, you're, you're incented to find problems. And I think, you know, the, the first step, certainly, like Eric said, is find a trusted partner that, that, you, that you can work with that's going to tell you how it is. And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to engage a legal counsel, too, um, on, on kind of a, just a, 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 you know, a consulting basis. Uh, you know, it's not, it's, attorneys do more than just, you know, draft contracts and file lawsuits. I mean, we, we consult with our clients. And if you were to come to an attorney or a law firm that has an, a, a, a track record of, of being involved in these types of implementations, they're going to be able to tell you, yeah, what, what, 
what this vendor is bringing up as a problem, that really looks like a substantive problem. And, and let's compare that with the contract. So, you know, I think, think, think expansively and, and, and use, you know, experts um, where it makes sense. Um, and, you know, don't, don't just pigeonhole people traditionally, because I think uh, certainly your legal counsel has a lot of value to offer. Yeah. Another thought uh, on that. That's a fantastic question. One, one thing that a QA firm should bring to the table early on is the, the idea of education. It's not a matter of we're, you know, as a, as a quality assurance group, we're not just trying to undig stuff and then throw it at you. We're helping the client ultimately identify the problems and collaboratively come to that understanding. So educating from early on as to what processes we're going to go through during the QA process, what we're looking for, the client will learn to understand and you'll be able to see those, those factors uh, ahead of time yourself. So it's not like things are just being presented to you, but it's a collaborative understanding of this is a problem and here's why. Yeah, I mean, it can also help too if you are, if the result of the assurance is that um, you have got trouble, um, the assurers can usually either with the support of the attorneys or not um, help to implement some vendor management structures and frameworks and actually get the vendors to start behaving themselves. Um, so that's a, that particularly is where the attorney can start to help is um, it, it, you're nowhere near litigation, but if your assurance has said that your vendor management, your vendor framework is not working, then getting the attorneys in early can help to shake the SI up a bit and make sure that they start behaving properly. Yeah, and we, we've done that on multiple occasions, and that's a really good point. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll engage with the vendor's in-house attorney, um, and it's not confrontational necessarily. You know, it, it, we're not unnecessarily escalating things, but it's just a heart-to-heart -heart conversation saying, look, this is going in a bad direction, and let's try to avoid, you know, unnecessary litigation and, and figure out what we can do. Um, and that's that, that can be incredibly helpful, and I think you know, Stuart talked about this a little bit earlier on the front end, you know, if you, if you have a process baked into your contracts where you've got some kind of a dispute resolution mechanism where, you know, change orders or, or um, your warranty claims or whatever, whatever it is, things aren't going right. They have to be escalated in a certain way. That, that can be a pretty beneficial process to, to utilize as well um, because it just keeps everybody honest. Yeah. Okay. Right. The next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's lots on this slide, um, but it's pretty simple. Um, really, what we're trying to do is look at the um, aspects of the um, program across every dimension we can think of. Um, so this has everything from procurement, um, organizational change management, master data management, testing, reporting, performance, business case the lot um, and the way we do this is with um, a load of checklists um, and depending on where you are in the program life cycle some of these um, element dimensions of the assurance may or may not be relevant I mean obviously um, if you're in the um, vision stage of a project uh, and you're still defining you know what the goals and objectives are we're not going to be too interested in assuring your testing um, uh, strategy um, because that's way before the thing. So um, how we would normally do this is um, at each insertion, we will work out what the key, where you are in the program, what the key dimensions of assurance we should be doing at each stage. Um, we also tend to find that there are some times when uh, you'll get more assurance in one particular area. So for example, when you're doing your procurement, we will obviously be doing more in the procurement space. Um, uh, and when you're uh, completing your build, uh, we'll be looking more in the testing space. So um, the, the assurance is not just one huge long checklist and we do the same checklist every time. Um, we look at where you are in a program, we work out which parts of the, of, of the assurance is the place that we should be focusing on in each insertion uh, and look at that. Yeah, and the other thing here too is that, you know, we, we use the same framework for clients at multiple points in the life cycle. So a lot of times companies say, hey, can you come in from the start and just do the quality assurance from day one? We have other clients that have us come in to do project recovery and we'll use the same framework for that. 
And then if Marcus or some other uh, attorneys hire us to be uh, an expert witness in a lawsuit, we'll use that same framework to analyze the case to figure out what went wrong and, and you know, come up with our analysis accordingly. So it's a pretty well battle tested framework that's been used in a number of different pretty extreme scenarios. So the idea is that, you know, if it can, if it can handle a lawsuit or an extreme failure, why not bring that same framework up front and use it to mitigate the failure in the first place or mitigate the challenges in the first place? Yeah. And I think the other thing that's really, really important is, uh, and I think Marcus uh, brought this out a couple of days ago in his presentation. Um, don't assume that the insurer, the assurance is just going to find problems with the SI. Um, because oftentimes we will find that on the client side, there are issues too. And obviously we're sensitive to making sure that when we're reporting those, we're reporting those to the client audience. Um, but certainly in the things, you know, one frequently things that come up, we've talked about OCM already, but um, the, the ownership of data or the stewardship of data, as we call it now, the cleansing and migration of data is frequently an area that we find clients struggle with uh, and they fall behind because the SI has got further forward with their part of the program uh, and the client hasn't been able to keep up. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a balanced view. It's not one that we just go after the all guns blazing on the SI. Right. And I think uh, to that point, uh, Stuart, having a, uh, a plan in advance, and you talked about that in some of the, the, the QA items that you'd want to have and see at the beginning, having a well-conceived data migration plan that includes what's your acceptance criteria, what are the methods you're going to use, what are the tools you're going to use, uh, you know, how many data um, mock loads are you going to do, when are you going to have what data objects available for internal testing and the iteration test cycles, all those kinds of things kind of go into that and that's often underestimated and falls on, you know, the, the, the ownership and, the, and the, uh, the blame goes on to the business when in reality, they really don't understand the scope of what needs to be done and they don't have the tools and the, the staff to do that, to do a proper plan. And don't forget what we're actually trying to do here, what we're trying to do is produce, assess and mitigate risk. So this is all about risk assessment and it's all about recommended actions. So we, you will get the risks enumerated, you'll get, if we can, the risks valued, and then you'll get a series of recommendations for every risk that we've identified um, and, and, and actions to remediate. Okay. So um, what's an IVMV typically look like? Um, so IVMV um, is not a third stage term, it actually was coined by NASA. Um, and it's uh, independent verification and validation. It's just an abbreviation that some organizations use for assurance. Um, and um, so you might see IVMV and assurance used interchangeably. Um, basically, it's a very, very simple process. It's kind of as you'd expect. Um, first of all, we try and find out uh, through a discovery where you are in your program, whether you perceive you have any problems, um, and then we'll ask for some artifacts. Those artifacts are usually going to be things like budget tracking, um, uh, program charter, uh, last three status reports, uh, things like that, just to give us a hook on kind of where where you think you are, um, and um, uh, you, uh, uh, and have a look at the quality of the collateral that's being produced, uh, and make sure that we understand the objectives of your program. Um, if you have one, we'll also want to look at your business case as well, because again, frequently uh, programs. Um, uh, struggle with business cases, especially assumptions that, that uh, aren't uh, strongly underpinned. Um, the, the, the thing we will also ask for is a set of candidates for um, some one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews or workshops. Um, we tend, sometimes we do workshops, sometimes we do one-on-one -on -one interviews, often it's a mix. Um, we will know Broadly speaking, depending on the size of your program um, and its shape uh, and, and which SI or which um, uh, vendor is supporting it, uh, what kinds of roles you would have in it um, and depending on where you are in your life cycle. So, you know, when, you, when you've 
coming through design, you will have a test manager. We will typically want to talk to the test manager. That would be um, a, a, an illustrative example. But definitely the executive team, definitely the team leads, um, definitely the people who are doing OCM, uh, the business sponsor, some business stakeholders, um, and definitely, definitely the software vendor and the SI. So um, that would be illustratively who we would want to do. As I said, some of those we can do with workshops. Um, the SI we'd probably do one-on-one, -on -one. the executive team we'd probably do one-on-one. -on -one. So that would be kind of the, the flavor and the balance. Um, and then there's a lot of hard grunt and graph that goes on in the background to crunch the numbers and to take the outputs um, from, if we've done surveys, we'll look at the survey results, we'll look at the results from the checklist, we might do some follow-up discussions, um, and then we'll basically produce a deliverable that summarizes our analysis, and it'll be, as I said, a findings, risk assessment, risk value if we can do it, recommendations, and if you, we think there are things that you should be doing that are leading practice that you're missing, then, then we'll, that'll come out onto the list. Um, and that will probably go through a few iterations that really, um, you know, we don't absolutely necessarily get everything we need right the first time round. Um, and you might say, oh, no, actually, there's a document for that. We didn't give it to you. And so you'll get that document and then that risk will be alleviated. So that's typically it's a little bit of an iterative process in this. And then obviously then there is the uh, findings. Um, and then if you require us to, we'll work on a remediation plan with you um, and can support you through the execution of the remediation plan. Um, these reports can be, if you know, if everything's going reasonably well, there are a few pages. Um, the, 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 the longest that I've ever had to write uh, on a program that was seriously, seriously impaired was 53 pages worth of analysis and recommendations um, with a nice executive summary that was three pages saying you, you, you need some serious help here. So that's, uh, that's kind of what you get out of it. We heard playing you a clip of Stuart, Rob, Marcus, Harris, and I presenting a presentation about digital transformation quality assurance. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're gonna take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 113. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on audio podcast platforms throughout the world, as well as LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Be sure to check us out wherever you prefer to like or listen or watch, I should say. We're in the midst of a conversation here with Stuart Robb, Marcus Harris, and myself talking about digital transformation quality assurance. Let's jump back into the conversation. So, Stuart, um, you're actually getting a lot of fan mail here. A lot of <laughs> okay. people wanting to read your blogs. Uh, so yeah. Someone may have even asked for your autograph. I can't remember. Um, but <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, though, there actually are a lot of comments of, about uh, you and this framework in general. Uh, just a couple comments that might help stimulate some more conversation. Uh, one is what an impressive panel today, especially Stuart. I was OCM communications lead for a project that halted about a year after I left. Had Stuart been there, I'd venture to say the project would have completed successfully. So, so no pressure there, Stuart. You, you would have I'll fixed tell it. You, I'll, I'll tell you something that's very interesting. On that. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, so I've done remediations for um, a number of organizations over my career. In fact, I'd spent about three or four years specializing in only doing remediations. Um, and I don't have a 100% success rate. And what's most interesting is um, that quite often, um, you'll be bought in as a remediation consultant, uh, maybe by the sponsor, 
but the program director or the program manager really doesn't want you there and he really doesn't want you involved in his life and therefore he's going to either passively aggressively resist you or he's going to ignore you or hope that you go away until there's some tipping point um and um i was on one uh, uh very large uh, erp program well over 100 million and um I was brought in because um, the IT, uh, the CIO realized that it was going horribly wrong. So he brought me in and I uh, did a remediation assessment. It took me about three months um, and I was doing it on my own and it was, it was um, uh, hell. Um, and I produced a report and the report that, that was panned. Uh, they all said I'm wrong, I don't know what I'm doing and it was terrible anyway. So uh, they got Deloitte in um, and funnily enough, the guy that they got in from Deloitte used to be a guy I worked with uh, an awful lot with Deloitte. So I knew this guy really well. And um, he went down the pub. Uh, we went down the pub and he said, so what's the story? And I said, I, 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 I find it out for yourself. But I'm pretty sure that if we compare notes at the end of it, we'll find that they're pretty much going to read identically. So anyway, they went through a, hundreds of thousands of pounds of remediation uh, assessment quality assurance with Deloitte um, took them about uh, eight weeks, uh, six weeks um, and had the usual Deloitte 20 consultants on site and broadly speaking the, um, uh, the, the subtle differences in the way it was presented but the broad conclusions were identical and at this point um, the program sponsor and the uh, and the CIO and the CEO were seriously concerned, but still didn't believe the results of the report. So they'd had one report from me, they'd had another one from report from Deloitte. The one from me cost the tenth of what the one from Deloitte cost, and they still didn't believe the answer. So they got a third SI in who claimed they specialised in ERP um, uh, remediations, um, um, who are all ex Accenture people actually. Um, and they came up and they did another remediation review. So they had an eight week reset and then they went and uh, started to implement their uh, remediation. Um, the client still didn't make enough changes in their senior leadership team. And after another year of burning money like it was going out of fashion, the whole thing just imploded on itself and collapsed without a single piece of usable technology or uh, business process resulting from it. So sometimes, if it, 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 you know, it's like a, um, I was going to say like a, a bad marriage. Um, you know, if 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 you're not willing to accept the findings and you're not willing to change, you're not willing to listen to what the marriage counsellor says, you're going to get nothing out of the process. Um, so uh, and and you know, some 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 of these are Titanic programs; they just cannot be saved. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. And there, there's a lot of politics, like you mentioned, they're difficult to navigate. Um, yeah. Another question here is, I believe that Little's problem was a deep functionality problem. Would the framework have caught this? So in other words, if there's a, there is a technical issue or a functionality issue with the software, you're implementing, would, the, would this framework catch that? Um, the, the answer to that is depends. Um, and um, the, the reason it depends, it depends on whether you ask us to look at uh, functional fit gap analysis. Um, uh, in general, uh, it, it, and it depends on the skill sets we put on the team that we agree with you. Um, I would be pretty comfortable doing a fit gap for NetSuite or Oracle um, or Agresso because those are all technologies that I know pretty well and I'm reasonably up to date with. Um, I wouldn't be comfortable doing a fit gap with SAP HANA because the last SAP system I worked on was ECC5. Um, and so in that instance, we would put a specialist on from our team who knew S4 HANA inside out and looked at your requirements and looked at the fit gap analysis that the SI had done and, and validated for you. So, um, you know, you'll get a team that's specific to your needs. So in that instance, in Diddle, yes, you would have got the right out answer as long as we'd agreed the right question in advance. Yeah, another role of, of quality assurance can, can spread even 
pre-implementation. And what you're talking about, this question leads to is a validation of software selection, essentially. Because this, yeah. what, what happened with Little, we believe, or I believe, would have been caught in a proper software evaluation. Um, that kind of mismatch with, with pure functionality. That can also be, if, you, if you've already come to a selection and you're looking at getting into implementation, we'd also recommend if you haven't gone through a more of a formalized evaluation process, doing a validation prior to implementation, because what that will do is outline the, the potential gaps of the solution and help you to mitigate those, find the workarounds and, and feasibility of that ahead of implement, just running into implementation. Just to reinforce that point, one organization that uh, I've worked with, um, uh, and I came in quite late in the process, um, had never done a requirements at all. Um, they'd got a standard um, industry accelerator business process framework, gone down that and said, yeah, I think we do pretty much all of those. We do some manufacturing, we do some logistics, we have a 3PL, we do standard R to R and P2P. Therefore, we need to go and find a product that does all of those things. And obviously now, um, you know, when they're finding out what those gaps really are, they're having to think of ways to try and plug some of those gaps. So it again goes back, if you start badly, it's very, very difficult to recover, especially if you've already signed up a five or 10 year contract with the, with the software vendor. You've got nowhere to go. Well, and the other key too is that even if you, let's just say um, everything that you and Brian just said fails or somehow you still get past the point of catching that there's a terrible functional fit and then you get into implementation and you realize then it's a terrible functional fit. The key there is to realize that as quickly as possible so you can figure out what to do about it. Because a lot of times what vendors and system integrators will do is they'll, they'll keep marching down that path and they're going to force it to fit somehow. And what a lot of times we'll say during these assessments is, well, you know, time out. Maybe, you know, we're not saying throw the baby out of the bathwater or get rid of the entire solution. But for this little area where the function, the functionality is not working, let's not force SAP or Oracle, whatever it is. Let's find a, a way to work around that. It could be a bolt-on solution or manual process. Maybe you customize, God forbid. But whatever it is, have a clear plan for how you're going to fix that problem. And I think that's where so many companies get into trouble. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think, you know, it's, that's why it's incumbent upon the vendor and, and, and upon the customer, you know, to have total transparency into the status of the project, because I think you know, this is where these string along fraud allegations come into play. I mean, I've, I've had in deposition, I've had, you know, software salespeople say, well, you know, yeah, yeah I said that. And the, so the software can do anything. It's just a matter of how much you want to pay for it, you know? Um, we can do modifications and extensions uh, till the cows come home. Um, and, you know, my, my response to that is like, well, that, that's great. But, you know, did you tell them how much it was going to cost? Well, no. Yeah, and, that, and that's a fundamental issue. You know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, to get some nice output, if you're lucky, you get some pretty diagrams. If I do it, you get a Word document because I don't do pretty diagrams. My PowerPoint skills aren't good enough for pretty diagrams. But um, uh, you'll, well, we have people that help you with that, right? That's exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so you get basically it's a risk assessment, and it looks at each of the areas that we've talked about, and it give you a risk high, medium, low, um, and then if we can value the risk, we'll put a value or a score against it um, to to say um, how likely it is. And then systems integrator assurance. So I think we mentioned this already uh, very briefly, um, but systems integrators assure each other and they also offer to assure themselves. There is no point in getting a systems integrator to mark their own homework. They might be truthful to themselves, but they will rarely be truthful to you if they find that there are major problems. Um, and very, very, very long time ago, um, I saw a systems integrator, I worked for a systems integrator who did exactly that, and it was shocking. Um, so don't get them to do their own homework. Um, be careful, I think, as um, Marcus or Eric said, of getting them to mark each other's homework, because they will be out to try and capture the business. So if you are not confident about your current um, systems integrator either get them independently assured or if you do decide to sling them out put the thing out to tender again don't just take the person who did the assurance and then start with them because you're just moving the problem from one 
um, errant teenager to the next one. Even worse thing, Stuart, I was going to throw in there is even worse than them being out to try and get each other's business is when they collude on it, when there's collusion yeah. and yeah. they, they kind of, they're nice. They play nice because they're going to carve out pieces of the project for each other. That's yeah. the worst I make, just as a, as a side note on that. Yeah. Um, the, the final two points, um, oddly enough, you tend to think that the systems integrators have all of the best practitioners in ERP in the entire world. And actually, I did an exercise with one of the SIs a few years ago. We worked out how many um, program managers and program directors there were, both on the SI side and the UK side, in the UK, who had done an ERP for a blue chip FTSE 100 or Fortune 500 company. And the answer was 100. And 100 is a staggeringly low number given how many you'll find if you do a search on LinkedIn for program director, program manager, ERP. Um, and out of those, um, I think probably six, uh, 40 have retired or are doing something else. There's about 60 left. Um, it's a very, very, very low number. So you should really do your homework when you're finding your assurance person or your program director or your program manager. They've got to really, really, really know what they're doing. And so many clients rely on the interview oh yeah he seems a nice chap well he can spell sap he must know what he's doing um and then only find out later that the wheels come off that particular wagon the other you thing know, that happens, sorry go on i was, I was just going to add to your point i think it's a great point and very well said it, this is so rampant in in the the cases that i get involved in and in fact i've got i've got canned language that i that i tell to juries because it just comes up all the time and it's something along the lines of you know they they use they use our, our project is a training ground for their inexperienced and unqualified consultants. And it goes, you know, it, 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 but, but my point is that it's exactly what Stuart's saying is that this is rampant. The, the level of inexperience that's in the ranks of these SIs is just shocking. Um, and again, you know, we'll have them on the stand or, or in deposition and we'll ask them, well, have you ever done this type of implementation for this industry before? And they just say, no, I mean, it's just damning. When I worked for an SI, one of the most shocking things I ever saw is I went into one of their solution centers in central London and every consultant's desk had a book introduction to COBOL or COBOL for dummies because uh, 50, 20 years ago, um, the number of people who knew COBOL was reducing and they were all coming out with C skills. They were working on a massive re-engineering of a COBOL system for a large client and they didn't have any consultants who knew anything about it. Um, <laughs> the last point on this is about software vendors. They are not systems integrators. They may claim they are. They may have professional services divisions. They are not. And it's very common that they too get confused. And what happens is you get into the project and they say, right, we nearly need some help with some data to migration. A software vendor will turn and say, no, we don't do that. Or we need some help with OCM. No, we don't do that. And so there's a mismatch between the expectation of what the software vendor does and the systems integrator. And this is particularly true where you get these accelerated solutions. All the software vendors will offer you accelerators. They will all be missing some key capabilities that you are going to need. Okay. Um, so does it always work uh, in the last, I think we've got one minute left. No, it doesn't. Um, the program disagrees with the recommendations, which is quite rare, um, although not unheard of, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the program agrees with the recommendations that doesn't act on them, that's quite infrequent. The program agrees with the recommendations, but wider organizational politics prevents the recommendations being acted on. That is absolutely the one that occurs um, very frequently. Um, it's politics, politics, politics. And then um, the last one is the assurance is done too late to save the initiative. Um, and that's very, very common. And that's because it hasn't been part of the DNA and that's why they blow up and that's why they end up writing off hundreds of millions of pounds or dollars or whatever country you're in. I think that's it, if I'm correct. In, oh no, there's one more. Um, assurance mitigates risks. Um, so, I mean, you can read that at your leisure. Um, and um, you need to flash up the last slide so they've got all our contact details and then we're done. Yep. 
Yeah, and, and one one question I want to ask you, Stuart, actually it's not my question, but from the audience here, is that how can we convince our management that just because a vendor or integrator is using the vendor's framework doesn't mean it's any good or useful. Oracle's AIM comes to mind as a tool that SI is way in front of executives, but yeah. it's an empty vessel. Um, if you go back to slide, whatever it was, that had lots of logos of companies that have ended up um, in the uh, in the newspapers. I mean, all of those will have had SIs that used a methodology of one form or another. And the fact that they're in the papers means that something about those methodologies didn't work. And nearly 100% of the time, the reason is because the people who are running the methodology didn't know what they were doing or made some fundamental mistakes, either on the client side or the vendor side or both. This is a people business. It's people delivering stuff. It's not methodologies. It's not framework. If the person is good, you'll be successful. If the person is not good or not strong, you'll fail. That's it. All right. Good stuff. Fun to hear that clip again after a couple of years, and hopefully you found that enjoyable and learn some things about quality assurance and why it's so important to digital transformations and how it might help your digital transformation. And, and hopefully that framework we presented too in that clip gives you some things to think about as you think about putting the project governance and the guardrails in place for your digital transformation to ensure that it's on time, on budget, to make sure you're minimizing operational disruption and to ensure that you're getting the full ROI and the full business value that you expect to get out of your digital transformation. So I want to thank you all for joining here today. That's all we've got for today. Uh, I encourage you to check us out every Wednesday with new episodes. In the coming weeks, we have a lot of great guests that are going to be on the show. Uh, we're going to have the president and chief technology officer of Infor, for example, the big uh, software vendor. He'll be on the show here in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll also have a segment uh, next week about emerging technology. So here's where we'll dive into some of the um, emerging technologies that you should be aware of and consider as you're going through digital transformation in the future. Um, those are just a couple examples of some of the guests we have coming up. So be sure to watch this episode, listen to the episode every Wednesday, and be sure to leave us a review too. In addition to any comments you have as it relates to the topics at hand, I encourage you to please leave a review, uh, especially if you're listening on audio podcast platforms. Uh, if you can give us a, a review or a rating, that helps us and it helps make sure that uh, we are not only learning from your feedback, but it also helps the algorithm get the podcast out to more people. So appreciate any any feedback you can share there. So hope you found this conf, this content helpful in today's episode. I want to thank you for joining. Thank you for being part of the show and part of this digital transformation community. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'll see you next time on Transformation Ground Control. Eric Kimberling, your host for today. <laughs> Let me start that over. Okay, hopefully that's a smooth transition there. Okay, we're here playing you a clip of 